Fifty million years have now passed since the introduction of the Canaries. The world has already seen significant changes since its colonization, with the Tempocenic era ushering in several tens of millions of years of relatively cool climactic conditions and the spread of desertification. By 50 million years post-establishment, the climate is the coldest it has ever been, as the Tempocenic era transitions into another, the Cryocene. Serena has now become a snowball moon, meaning that at least half of the moon's surface, at any given time through the year, is below the freezing point of water and covered in either ice or snow. The extreme north and south pole have become uninhabitable for most life at any time of year, but from the tropics to approximately halfway to either pole, conditions remain seasonal but habitable, reaching warm and mild levels through the summer and into the fall. The landmasses of Striata, Hualteria, and Cari have collided to form a single continent in Serena's east, which straddles the equator, with arms stretching both north and south into the frozen zones of either pole. In the west, Enkiska has separated into a northern and southern continent, the northern moving into the Arctic Circle, and the southern colliding to form a southerly landmass with Stevlandia, the northern portion of which rests on the equator. The Kirin Islands rest nearly at the moon's prime meridian, an ideal location for life on the cold world today. Increasingly cold climactic conditions have favored the refinement of adaptations that began to develop on Serena in the beginning of the Tempocenic. Better able to reproduce in environments where winters are harsh than other birds, the live-bearing ard geese, which incubate their eggs inside of their bodies, have come to dominance over most environments away from the equator. No longer tied down by the need to keep an egg warm, they can breed in the early spring before the snow has fully melted, when any naked egg would be at a high risk to freeze solid if left for more than a few moments uncovered. Herds of grazers now migrate seasonally from one hemisphere to the other, avoiding the winter chill, some always following the summer sun, while the group which was once adapted generally as large herbivores has begun to dabble with forms specialized for other niches and diets. The original cursorial predator canaries, the skikes and their kin, have become relegated to the tropics, while newly evolved carnivorous ard geese have taken their place where winters are long. They have become increasingly diverse in size, both larger and smaller. One group in particular, native to the frigid north, have become quite small and increasingly adapted towards burrowing to survive the cold. Among the flying birds evolution continues to produce forms convergent to unrelated earth lineages and poor flying ground birds, intelligent generalists similar to crows and jays, and predatory falconaries of many sorts, including owl-like nocturnal predators, are abundant with ranges that span the globe. Even after 50 million years, however, many canaries retain primitive and conservative body plans. Just as the lizard still resembles the earliest diapsids and the opossum a close doppelganger to the earliest of mammals, the generalized finch niche is likely to last through all that Serena has to throw its way. One of the major innovations in the birds to appear by the start of the Cryocene is the evolution of multiple aquatic avian groups, 
from both semi-aquatic, duck-like ancestors, which are still abundant worldwide, as well as from more airborne predatory groups, such as the fishing falconaries that converge upon ox. The pelicanaries, a flightless group of cormorant-like seabirds, which developed the behavior of incubating their eggs at sea within their throat pouches rather than in nests on shore, have speciated significantly. Adaptations evolved originally to avoid competition for onshore nests now had multiple benefits. Like the ard geese on land, practicing a form of internal incubation could prove advantageous in colder climates, allowing the pelicanaries to exploit polar seas for food without having to migrate to warmer climates to nest. Freed from the need to come ashore and sit on their eggs, they are no longer constrained to relatively small sizes, and their representatives now include the largest birds ever to live. Serena's fish have, by this time, reached a diversity equaling that of Earth, and in all of them, their specific ancestry is not apparent. Unlike the majority of Earth's fish, however, the majority are still live-bearing. The largest among them have evolved placentas to nourish their young in utero, and begin to develop complex social behavior. The descendants of semi-aquatic mudwickets have moved increasingly into terrestrial habitats. Though generally intolerant of dry conditions, they've cut their ties to open water almost completely, and many species have evolved to live entirely on land in moist environments, such as forest floors and jungles. Most species burrow to some extent. The ability to hibernate has evolved, allowing survival in even quite arid locales and regions with harsh winter temperatures. The flora of a snowball serena has adapted as much, if not more than, the fauna. The dominant floral group across serena today is bamboo, which has speciated quickly in increasingly specialized mutualistic co-evolution with ants, and spread again across the planet after an initial decrease in range. The symbiosis between ants and bamboo plants had now produced a floral revolution comparable to the appearance of the first flowering plants, as the bamboo is able to colonize anywhere it likes, armed with armies of biting insects that protect them from both herbivores and competitors. By attacking browsing animals and cutting down competing plant seedlings around their host plants that could steal their nutrients. Multiple evolutionary arms races have now begun in earnest, with herbivores evolving armored faces to protect against ant bites when feeding on both ant-guarded plant varieties and their competitors which have evolved a myriad of defenses from the leafcutter ants. Some plants sport billions of microscopic cutting blades of silica on every leaf that turn formerly succulent foliage into tufts of knives, while others develop elaborate furry coats of spines to guard their tissues against ant attacks. Serena is no longer an idyllic grassland world. Now the plants themselves fight not only the animals that once fed freely upon them, but each other too. Sunflowers have adopted a new form in the face of harsh, dry climates. They lost their leaves and developed swollen tissues. The sunflower cactus spreads across Serena's drier parts and does particularly well in the harsh north. Where on earth grow conifers in the boreal forest? Serena's cold woodlands 
are predominantly of tall cactus lookalikes, descended originally from a common garden flower. Their thick, barrel-like shape resists drying winds, and thick coats of furry spines double as defense and insulation. Their ancestry can now often only be betrayed by when they bloom. The leafcutter ant lineage, once relegated to the tropics, now occurs everywhere on the planet where plant life occurs, wintering in special hollowed out tissues within the stems and nodes of their symbiotic bamboo homes, where they're able to stay warm through the winter and safer from predators. In addition to lodging, the bamboo plants may also pay their defenders with food in the form of nectar secreted from within its stems. Though many species now are no longer farming fungus and have become predatory, eating pest insects that harm their host. The pinnacle of their interdependence has now been reached, and no longer do new queen ants have to search out seedlings of their host trees to start a new colony. Reproduction between plants and insect has become timed so that the tree's seeds ripen just as the new queens take flight to start a new life. When she leaves, the female takes with her a single seed and plants it herself. She selects a sunny site of newly exposed soil near a riverbank or where a fire has cleared the land and buries the seed, constructing a small tunnel system beneath it where she begins to lay her own eggs. Until the seedling is large enough to move into, they live beneath it and guard it from all comers, bringing fertilizer to its roots in the form of the remains of small prey the workers bring down into the burrow and their own droppings. When the plant is large enough, the colony moves into it, typically just as autumn approaches, and there they spend the winter. Colonies of ants may inhabit the same bamboo plant for decades, and the queens are extremely long-lived. The proliferation of ant diversity has not gone unnoticed, and ant-eating animals have evolved in many different clades, specialized to make use of this resource other animals shy away from. A battle from many fronts between ants, birds, and plants rages on. The Ard Geese, a group of ancestrally herbivorous flightless canaries which first appeared 40 million years ago, have become one of Serena's most diverse groups on land. In the hundreds of thousands of thousands of generations since they first appeared, the group has exploded in diversity and spread across the planet, from east to west and pole to pole. Since the separation of Anthkiska and Striata in the north, however, different lineages of the clade have been isolated from one another. In the east, the Avo Vivaves, a group of cursorial birds which practice internal incubation of their eggs, have spread and diversified abundantly. Different lineages have developed to exploit a wide variety of ecological niches in addition to herbivory, including carnivores and specialized insectivores, displacing many other canary groups, particularly early predator lineages. In the increasingly isolated west, however, where the ard geese first originated, a wider variety of unrelated canary diversity survives. The continents of Anghiska and Striata separated shortly 
after the ancestors of the Avo Vivavian Ardgis crossed into the east, providing a haven for diversity which has been lost or is withering elsewhere in the face of competition from this up and rising new group. The Live Bearing Bird Avo Vivavian Ardgis, or Vivas for short, are not truly live bearing. Rather, they lay eggs which hatch within hours, sometimes as long as a few days of exiting the body. Nonetheless, this is such an advantage over the lengthy external incubation periods of other birds that by 50 million years post-establishment, the vivas have outcompeted them to a very significant extent in both polar regions upon Serena's eastern supercontinent, where the cold climate makes traditional nesting difficult for large terrestrial birds. By the time such birds will have begun laying, the live bearers will have already born their chicks. In addition to totally displacing other herbivorous groups, such as the blundering wombles, the vivas have begun to greatly diversify ecologically. One notable group remained herbivores, specializing further into their grazing or browsing niches and developing more efficient methods of feeding. Known as serolopes, they chew their food like the ancestral viva of 25 million years ago, using a muscular tongue to grind plant matter against plates in the roof of the mouth before swallowing. And in order to keep it in the mouth, they've now begun to develop fleshy cheeks along the mouth to prevent it from being lost before it gets into the stomach. The beak has become reduced to the end of the snout, fulfilling a niche like the front teeth of a mammal. Other vivas became generalists, moving away from their initial browsing adaptations and adopting more carnivorous habits, some already consuming an occasional insect while foraging for plant food, begin to include these more frequently in their diets until they eat little else. Others learn to break open and eat the eggs of more primitive birds and begin driving most of their former predators to extinction before moving into their niches themselves by feeding upon first small, then larger animals. Mirroring the earlier predator canaries, the skikes, truly hypercarnivorous vivas evolved to pursue and hunt other flightless birds. Some specialize for speed and run down their meals, killing them with the beak like Earth's terror birds, while the elusive banshees specialize as cunning, solitary ambush hunters, leaping upon unsuspecting victims, digging in their claws, and flapping their remnant wings to keep balanced before delivering a killing blow with a powerful jaw in the manner of raptors. One of the more novel niches which vivas have exploited on Serena by this time is that of giant, ground-based anteaters. Forest communities worldwide have appeared on the world now which are largely or entirely symbiotic with ants. Ants protect the trees from browsers and mow down competing vegetation and now are sometimes even necessary for the dispersal of the tree's seeds and their continued survival. As plant and ant have forged a link, the ant population has skyrocketed, and the bulk of animal mass in some Saranen forests is now made up mostly of trillions of these arboreal ants making them a much more available food source than on Earth. Birds like the Shimmer Snoot, tropical jungle dwellers with faces highly elongated and protected from
from stinging bites by hard, iridescent scales and scutes, may otherwise be shaped like browsers with long necks and long legs, but feed not on the leaves of the forest they skulk, but rather the enormous quantities of ants that come rushing to the defense of the branches as it rustles through them. For most browsers, the ants are a nuisance, but for the shimmer snoot, that's exactly what it's come for. Weighing several hundred pounds and standing taller than a man, it sweeps up more than 20 pounds of them from the canopy in a good day with its long, bristle-covered tongue, and still makes no noticeable dent in their numbers overall. The shimmer snoot's jaw is partially fused and the beak reduced to a small hooked covering on the tips of the jaws, able to break open ants' nests within plant tissues to get at their prey. Also insectivorous are the bumblets, very small ard geese, which have evolved to dig and shelter in burrows for protection from predators and inclement weather, using the very large claws on their adulas to loosen the soil ahead of them and kicking it behind them with their very large feet. They feed mainly on earthworms and the larvae of beetles and have a large, tweezer-like beak to snatch these prey up, but still grind it in the mouth before swallowing it. Though they are true vivas and incubate their eggs internally, they are quite divergent from their relatives. Most closely related to the shimmer snoots, they lack the specialization of them to feed on ants, and have a much longer beak that covers most of their jaw, as in the ancestral canaries. Vivas are the first bird group on Serena to truly redevelop a long tail, and most groups exhibit both an elongated torso behind the legs, which supports the ovaries of females, and additional vertebrae on the end of the spine. The new tail helps these birds to maintain their balance, being at its extreme in species which frequently run at high speeds. Counterclockwise from left, the red-crowned banshee, a dog-sized ambush predator, jumping on the back of prey and holding onto it with its hooked talons. The banshee kills its prey by biting into its neck using its powerful beak. The imperial shimmer snoot, a large and long-legged anteater, the shimmer snoots are the only vivas to retain fully developed plumage on their necks, which sport colorful iridescence. Such veined plumage is also still present on the crowns, wings, and tails of most vivas, while the body plumage is extremely primitive and hair-like, made up only of single, unbranched strands. Males use their colorful necks, as well as the vibrant scales on their long snouts, which give them their common name, to entice potential mates. Black-backed Serolope, a gregarious herd-dweller from the cold northern plains, which exhibits a large and swollen covering to its nostrils, useful for heating cold polar air before taking it into the body. The structure is filled with thick bristles and is also quite effective at filtering dust from the air. Banded Bumblet, a small, burrowing insectivore. It has reduced wings, but very large thumb claws used to dig large and often quite complex communal burrow systems. Mud Wickets, 
A group of semi-terrestrial guppies that first appeared about 25 million years ago have diversified enormously since the middle Tempicenic, despite a cooling climate. Found across the subtropical belt in Serena's east, where Striata meets Walteria, these formerly water-bound fishes have begun to totally cut their ties to the water. Many mudwickets now live entirely on land, in the soggy leaf litter of forests and jungles, or in deep burrows in drier environments. Their pectoral fins have become well suited to digging, with five exceptionally large claw-like rays. So long as they can keep moist, they needn't ever actually submerge in water anymore, and oxygen is absorbed through all of their skin right out of the air, including that of the gill membranes, but particularly the mouth, which is brilliantly red with oxygenating tissue. As guppies are mudwickets that breed internally, with the male using the gonopodium fin located under his tail, to transfer sperm directly into the female's body and to her ovaries, negating totally the need for water even to breed, as amphibians require. The young can move on land from infancy and are usually born in burrows. Some species are protected by the parents for a short time after birth until they leave to begin hunting on their own. Two angry male mudwickets argue over territory. Mudwickets are strange-looking animals, with bulbous eyes, often wide-grinning mouths, and colorful dorsal fins on their backs. Their jaws are extendable and full of needle-sharp teeth, for they are all carnivores, and males in particular are aggressive and showy creatures battling over territory and flaring fins and brightly colored jaws and gill covers to intimidate one another and attract the attention of smaller females. Though tough they are in demeanor, they are squat and chubby creatures and ungainly at best in locomotion, and their battles often involve nothing more than pushing against one another until one or both roll over. They can pull themselves along with their clawed pectoral fins underground, while above ground they rely on thrusts of their squat but still well-muscled tails to produce short hops. The tail now lacks a fin and is specialized to the task of propulsion over land, curving to the side and ending in a flattened pad of rough scales to get traction on the ground. Mudwickets may be either right-tailed, with their tail twisting to the right, or left-tailed, and this determines which way they most effectively jump, though neither is particularly good at aiming for an exact perch. Most species spend most of their time underground, feeding on small worms, grubs, and other such beasties, and rarely move around over land during the day, preferring to do so in the dark when their avian predators are less active. Unfortunately, one group of animals, which has recently appeared on the world of birds, doesn't share the same preferences of time to hunt slithering quietly out of forest pools and streams with a side-to-side -side slinking motion through the moss and liverworts, the eel snake searches for food. Eel snakes are elongated, eel-shaped sword-tail fishes, one to two feet in length, which have evolved to hunt on land as well as in the water. Taking in atmospheric oxygen via a lung-like bladder 
budding off their stomachs, they too can stay out of water indefinitely, as long as they stay relatively moist. Spending the day resting at the bottom of pools, tangled in vegetation, and occasionally striking out at some small passing prey item, they do most of their hunting on land. Traveling by night, when the ground is moist with dew, does the trick to ensure they don't get too dry while they're at it, as the hunters emerge in groups from the water, like shimmering rubber ropes, and quickly disappear into the undergrowth. They shuffle their heads around this way and that, showing off an exceptionally mobile neck for a fish. They press their snouts deep into the mud and inhale every few feet, sniffing around in search of their preferred prey, earthworms, slugs, and mudwickets. Their eyes, which work well underwater, are a bit blurry on land, but the eel snake has an excellent sense of smell, heightened by a pair of short barbels that carry scent particles right up to the nostrils from the ground. An eel snake slithers over a forest floor in search of food. When the eel snake finds something in the burrow, it strikes quickly and aggressively, wrapping its highly elastic jaws around the prey and positioning it via its long, backwards curved teeth into a position to be swallowed whole, head first for vertebrate prey. The mudwicket may struggle, inflating its body with air and thrashing with its claws, but it's no use. Unable to cry out without vocal cords, the only sound it can make as its tail slaps down the hungry hunter's gullet is the faint squeak of the air it just inhaled being compressed out of its body. It may struggle for a while in the eel snake's stomach while it turns around in the burrow and makes its way, a little more slowly, back to its pool to digest. Eventually without oxygen in the predator's stomach, the prey is suffocated and the eel snake slides back into the water, making its way back to a cozy tangle of water weeds to rest. A large meal can satiate it for a week, but before long it will be back on the shore once again in search of another course. Originally, most mud wickets were quite defenseless to predators such as the eel snake, relying on camouflage and the safety of their burrows alone to avoid predation, and still often being taken by birds and other animals, until some developed a new line of defense. Poison, concentrated in their skin and scales, from a diet of the noxious ants and other insects that are so numerous in Serena's forests, proved a successful deterrent to predators. An eel snake that bit into a neurotoxic mudwicket wouldn't get a chance to try to do so again. But neither would the mudwicket, already swallowed down the predator's gullet. To the protection of both parties involved, one group of highly toxic mudwickets armed itself with a vibrant warning coloration, bold and contrasting splotches of blue, yellow, black, and red. Biological signs yelling loudly and clearly, I am deadly. The poison dart mudwickets were born. Just like their frog analogs in the rainforests back on Earth, predators steer far clear of any squat little creature hopping unperturbed on the forest floor while wearing the cloak of colored death. 
some of the brightly colored mud wickets, no longer having predators to fear, have become diurnal. Others have lost many of their burrowing adaptations, no longer needing to hide to survive. And hitching a ride on the bandwagon, a fair few harmless mud wickets with completely innocuous diets have developed mimicry of their poisonous kin to avoid predators without actually being toxic at all. A brightly colored mud wicket made toxic by a diet of poisonous ants advertises its unpalatability. From left to right, a sampling of five desert plants. The three upon the left are specialized sunflower trees, exhibiting varying degrees of adaptation to survive arid environments. The Devil's Cigar This columnar, clumping sunflower is a long-lived perennial. To protect its juicy stems from evaporation and the attacks of thirsty animals, its leaves have become reduced to needle-sharp scales edged in silica platelets that will give a nasty cut to anything desperate enough to attempt to bite into it. Its flowers are small and inconspicuous, born near the leading growth at the tips of the stems and pollinated by small flying insects. It sets seed into the air, attached to small parachutes of fibers that catch the wind. Stems grow indefinitely from an underground rhizome with only a single growing tip, and if broken will die back rather than develop secondary branching. In good conditions they may reach heights of 7 feet, but typically become damaged before this. New trunks which rise from the roots replace old ones which have lost their growing tips. The Zucchini Tree This sunflower is a large, tree-like species which grows a single trunk. When young, it is covered in a protective coat of sharp spikes like the devil's cigar, but once it reaches a significant height beyond the reach of most herbivores, it stops producing this armor, retaining this defense only on its lower trunk. Its flowers are large and born in groups at the tips of its rounded, zucchini-shaped stems. Once a stem has produced a flower, it does not continue to grow, but unlike the devil's cigar, it doesn't die back, but instead puts out several side branches which continue to grow upwards. The zucchini tree thus multiplies its shoots by two or three times with each tuft of flowers it puts out. The sunflower tree still puts out leaves as it grows, but they are short-lived, being shed during the dry season, at which point the plant photosynthesizes with its stems alone. When blooming, the tree's stems briefly take on a primitive appearance with larger leaves in the weeks before flowering, giving the impression of small garden sunflowers grafted to the top of an ungainly cactus. These leaves are shed along with the flowering stems within a few weeks, as soon as the plant's seeds have been produced. Because the zucchini tree is a long-lived plant rather than an annual one, like its ancestor, it cannot afford to produce large amounts of large, tasty seeds that may be taken up by birds. It thus produces small, bitter seeds in large, inedible pods, which break open and disperse via the wind and attract little attention from birds similarly to the devil's cigar. The Desert Bottle Brush This very cactus-like sunflower grows only a single trunk and never branches. Its flowers are large and showy, 
pollinated by birds, and it produces large and savory fruits in which it hides its seeds in order to disperse them through the guts of animals that consume them. It grows only small, vestigial green leaves while blooming. Its leaves otherwise adapted into large and very sharp spines that protect its fat, water-filled trunk from animals. This plant is not a sunflower, but rather a dandelion, a direct descendant of the scrubby bushes of the Angiscan drylands of 15 million years post-establishment. Resembling a yucca or an aloe, it is still a branching shrub or small tree with extremely sharp leaves edged in microscopic serrations to guard against herbivores, but now grows considerably larger. Its flowers have changed and no longer born singly. It now sends out long, pendulous bunches of brightly colored and nectar-rich flowers at the points where its leaves meet its stems. Birds are its main pollinators, of course. Its method of seed dispersal remains that of its ancestors. Tufted, lightweight seeds cast out into the wind. Desert bamboo, a primitive bamboo, it lacks the symbiotic ants of its more derived forest building relatives and has been driven out of its preferred wet and fertile habitat by its relatives' insect defenders to the cold deserts of northern striata. The dry environment has had a very significant effect on its growth habit, and it no longer produces tall canes, but rather exists as a small and inconspicuous clump of spiny grass for most of its long life hardly even recognizable as a member of the bamboo family. It spends 150 years in this state, slowly building a large and wide-ranging root system throughout the desert and spreading by runners but never reaching more than 15 inches tall, until some mysterious timer within the bamboo cells goes off. When this happens, Every member of a given species reroutes all of the tediously collected and stored energy from its roots and tissues into producing a single enormous flower stalk that can reach up to 30 feet tall. Timing its reproduction so closely with its fellows across the desert, the resulting boom of seeds briefly overwhelms the appetite of all the animals which feed upon them ensuring that some will survive to germinate no matter what. After a lifespan of one and a half centuries, it blooms for just a few weeks and dies after its seeds have dried, having used every last ounce of its energy to produce its offspring. The extremely sporadic abundances of its seeds produce a brief flurry of reproduction in all life that feeds upon them, and a very successful nesting season for all the desert's birds, only to be followed by a massive population crash when the food is no longer available by next season. It is possible that in addition to the protective benefits gained from producing too many seeds for the animal population to eat, the bamboo helps its offspring in another way. By encouraging a population spike and then a die-off of the animals which would otherwise potentially eat its young seedlings the next year when they sprout. A variety of Serena's less derived bird groups which inhabit desert environments have been illustrated alongside the flora. Examples shown include a couple of primitive seed eaters, an insect-eating bird which has begun to include flower nectar in its diet, a large, turkey-like and poor-flying omnivore, a dove-like terrestrial seed eater, and a long-legged falconary 
which hunts prey on the ground, and a small predatory finch, which eats insects and smaller birds. The boreal forests of Antgiska are another biome on Serena, which the descendants of sunflowers have readily colonized. Too cold for much of the year for bamboo or its ant symbiotes to thrive, near the tree line the dominant plant type are another branch of sunflower trees. Sharing a common ancestor to the cactus-like survivors of more southerly deserts, tall forests of pine flowers have adapted their hard, drought-resistant leaves into thin, conifer-like needles filled with a thick and bitter sap that keeps them from freezing in even the harshest winter weather. Tall and woody trunks rise like columns out of the moss-covered ground here, led by a single growing tip which regularly pulls out whorls of branches that grow outwards into the sides. If the leading shoot is cut off, the plants will grow another, like a true pine tree, though they may never regain their former symmetry. They flower abundantly on the tips of their side branches in the spring, with flowers that have entirely lost their petals. They are pollinated by the wind. The resulting seeds they produce, fatty and nutritious, are formed in corncob-like pods of tightly packed seeds which many animals have evolved to exploit. Parrot-like finches gnaw them open. Smaller birds, such as the brilliantly violet-colored indigo seed-eater, laboriously work each individual seed from its holdings, while giant, flightless omnivores, such as the anvil beak, a descendant of the axe-bills that first appeared 40 million years ago, simply crush them to a pulp cob and all, with enormous bills that work equally well to break open the marrow from bones left by other scavengers, or even to catch and subdue smaller birds. Many small songbirds here, such as the tree-climbing blue-crowned false nuthatch and the melodious yellow-headed canary thrush, feed on a varied diet of seeds in winter and abundant insect larvae in the summer. A colorful pheasant-like game bird, distantly related to the turkey-like specimen previously noted in the desert biome, picks at fallen seeds and insects in the moss while a flightless swordbill, a lightweight cursorial predator, descended from the large skikes of the dry plains of 25 million years ago that moved into the forest and shrunken in size to better scurry through the trees and branches, searches the woodland of small animals it can catch in its long bill and swallow whole. Near a rain puddle, a pair of sexually dimorphic waterfowl canaries rest, the white-faced male keeping an eye out for danger while his mate drinks. This species longer of leg than most, have evolved semi-terrestrial habits again and nests in hollow forest trees, raising their precocial chicks in nearby streams. Flowering clover and daisy-like sunflowers abound in the forest's sunlit clearing during the springtime. Fifty million years have passed on the small green moon of Serena since the first canaries were set free upon the land. In these long intervening years, a world was built from the barest of foundations to a diverse palette of life today unmatched anywhere in the cosmos. The descendants of Serena's very first songbirds have today conquered land air, and sea, filling an ecological vacuum in a world without other tetrapods to compete with in ways that our own world has never known. 
One of the most specialized lineages of birds of Serena, 50 million years post-establishment, are the balloons. Growing to more than 60 feet, or 18 meters in length, and weighing up to 15,000 pounds, or 6,800 kilograms, they are a family of gentle, herbivorous leviathans, the largest birds to have ever so far existed, which make their existences a Serena's analog to sea cows across the moon's tropical seas, where they graze upon immense undersea meadows of kelp and seagrass, eating up to a thousand pounds of it in a day's time. Several times too heavy to leave the water, and with their hind limbs all but vestigial, fused to their pygostyles, these easygoing, wing-powered swimmers spend their entire lives at sea, from hatching to death. This is possible because, well, like all birds so far to evolve at this time, the balloons must lay hard-shelled calcified eggs, eggs that cannot survive prolonged immersion in seawater. They belong to an ingenious order of seabirds, which have found a unique and exceptional method of caring for their eggs, which requires no visitation to the shore in the form of mouth brooding. Mouth brooding, at its simplest meaning, to protect the eggs or young from predators by hiding them in the mouth, is a relatively common behavior in many fishes and even some tetrapods. The reproductive behavior of the balloons, however, marks a first in birds. In these species and their relatives, it exists as a highly derived behavior originating from an ancestral tendency to protect the young chicks from danger or keep them warm by carrying and holding them in a pouch below the bill, which likely first appeared more than 30 million years ago in the balloon's pelican-like ancestors, a group aptly known as pelicanaries, long flightless seabirds evolved from the dugal of the Antkiskan floodplains. Once this was well established over time, it was not a large step to also hold the eggs themselves there, for being able to transport one's unhatched young, which virtually no other bird is known to do, even though the behavior is commonplace in mammals and even crocodilians, proved a highly beneficial behavior for a large seabird which nested increasingly far from land and upon less and less stable mats of plant material in the matter of a grebe, pushed from more choice breeding locations ashore by rampant predators and competitors on the world of birds. With eggs in this situation likely to roll into the water at the slightest mishap, evolution favored those eggs both most tolerant to brief immersion, with large and buoyant air pockets and waxy eggshell cuticles less easily permeated by seawater, and behaviorally, those birds which as breeding adults would still recognize their own eggs outside the perimeter of a chosen nest which very few birds today can, and further, which were both willing and able to return lost eggs to the nest if they were to fall out. As this novel egg retrieval behavior developed, and the parent bird's mouth evolved to be increasingly well suited to the transport of both eggs and young, and furthermore, as one group of pouched piscivores became too large and ungainly to easily sit upon any manner of floating nest, they began to incubate their single eggs directly upon their soft, feathered backs. By taking turns to transfer the egg between them and covering it by turning the head over their shoulder and covering it with the warm, soft skin of the underside of the throat pouch, they found a new way to provide the developing eggs with safety, warmth, and humidity, independent of any true nest site at all. This was effective, but for the most part required the protection of colonial breeding in isolated calm, 
shallow waters to truly work out. And so from here, it was not long before one group was to eventually begin to hold the eggs directly inside the throat pouch at all times. This freed the adults to move freely whilst incubating and more importantly hid the vulnerable egg from predators entirely, factors which together allowed the birds to develop secondarily less colony-dependent lifestyles and to subsequently diversify greatly. Now the male simply plucked the floating eggs from the water as the female dropped them and maneuvered them safely and quickly into the pouch to incubate while still allowing to feed himself and keep alert for predators. The egg became increasingly large, and insulated by the fat and tissue of the neck, it is effectively impossible to crack, for a strong enough blow to rupture it would also break the adult's neck. Oxygenated every time the adult surfaced to breathe, kept warm and moist within the adult's body, in this way the balloon's ancestors developed a roundabout way to nurture their developing young within the safety of their bodies and to circumvent the formerly universal avian need to tend a nest on dry land. When the chick is ready to hatch, the eggshell is now much too thick for it to escape without parental assistance, so it begins peeping a signal to the parent to gently crack the egg with a horny nail at the end of their bill, which has adapted for just such this use. The chick can swim and feed itself from birth, but remains close by its parents for several years, generally protected by merit of their great size and highly protective nature. Adults can rear as many as three clutches in a year, and as chicks do not immediately disperse, may be seen to be watching clutches as many as six or sometimes more young of various ages at any given time. For additional protection, adults frequently form crutches with other adults of several dozen or more young, guarding them as a herd from the myriad of predators which may lurk the shallow coastal areas that the gentle giants roam, in hopes of picking off a straggler similarly to many earth water birds. Herds of bloons are rarely organized, but individual pairs mate for life, and good feeding grounds can attract loosely associated gatherings of hundreds or rarely thousands of the animals along especially fertile coastlines. Bloons are the most specialized member of their order at this period in time, having traded their piscivorous tendencies for a diet of green plants and algae, and rarely slow-moving invertebrates, all managed by a goose-like serrated bill. Most of their relatives retain a more carnivorous diet, with diets ranging from small fishes and marine vertebrates, up to large seabirds, and even small balloons. Though they may differ greatly in appearance, size, and lifestyle, however, they can all be allied by their unique manner of internal incubation. Incubation is a joint affair, with pairs regularly transferring the precious cargo between them twice a day to feed, whilst the other parent rests near the surface so as to create a calm and stable environment for its developing young. Modern balloons have almost wholly lost their plumage and retain only a very thin layer of fuzz over their bodies, generally just a few millimeters in length. Too large and bulky to properly preen, they are instead insulated by their body fat. The male emperor balloon, Partifagus imperialis, from the Latin partis meaning childbirth and phagus meaning to consume. Cetiform pelicanaries, colloquially known as bird whales, are very large, entirely aquatic pelicanaries 
which occur in abundance across all of Serenus seas by the Cryocene. A group which includes the Bloon, it's a highly diverse clade with representatives that fill many different niches, all tied together by their mouth-brooding behavior. By incubating their single large eggs in their throat pouches rather than on land, all bird whales have cut their ties to the shore, freeing some to become the largest birds ever to live. Whereas the basal balloon is an herbivore, most bird whales are predatory and eat either fish, plankton, or other aquatic invertebrates. Forms are specialized as pursuit hunters, bottom feeders, and filter feeders, the latter being among the most specialized. Bird whales use large paddle-shaped wings to swim through the water, sometimes also using their hind limbs to assist, while in other groups, the hind limbs are fused into a rudder-like tail. They're almost totally featherless, with smooth skin and keep warm with insulating layers of body fat. Fish-eating bird whales often exhibit large pseudo-teeth in their bills to hold onto their prey, while planktonivores have wide gaping mouths in gigantic throat pouches to scoop up large mouthfuls of seawater. While taking in food, the tongue is lifted to the roof of the mouth, blocking water from going down the throat into the stomach or airways. The tongue is then brought down and the water is strained out of the mouth through hair-like cilia which have formed on its edges, producing a seeming net that catches any small fish or invertebrates which are then consumed. Some filter feeders specialize on small fish, while others target saranin krill, which are any variety of free-swimming crustaceans, from copepods and shrimp to crab larvae. Some bird whales feed by filtering the sediment on the sea floor. While most filter feeding bird whales are very large animals, they are not on the whole as large as the biggest whales on earth. The very longest bird whale species, in fact, is not a filter feeder at all. It is the Bloon, a vegetarian of coastal waters. Filter feeders are most abundant in the cold polar seas near Serena's poles, where the waters are rich in nutrients. The calves are born large and able to swim and feed themselves at birth, but require their parents' guidance to find food and avoid predators. They stay with their parents for many years before becoming independent. Bird whales mate for life almost always being found in pairs at the minimum, with some species living in large, extended families. If lucky, the largest bird whales can live for more than 200 years. The Great Blue Blorca, which feeds on plankton in the cold northern and southern seas, is one of the largest filter-feeding bird whales, just over 50 feet in length. By the start of the Cryocene, bamboo has become one of Serena's most successful plant groups and makes up entire forest communities in some subtropical equatorial habitats. Fast growing, hardy, and adaptable already in its ancestral form, it has begun to evolve in several new directions by 50 million years post-establishment. Illustrated above are examples of the growth habits of four groups of bamboo present on Serena by this time, labeled A, B, C, and D. A is the ancestral plant from which B, C, and D descend, and grows individual bamboo canes directly from a large underground rhizome, which can spread almost indefinitely in any direction via underground stems. 
This ability to quickly spread across Serena in its early history initially gave bamboo an advantage over most other plant groups, though this rate of spread was only possible in very fertile and wet climates. Bamboo forests of this growth habit typically grew and spread for a lengthy period of time, anywhere from a few decades to over 100 years, before flowering, dying, and slowly regenerating over the next 10 to 20 years from seedlings, a habit retained in many Saranen species today, including the desert bamboo, which takes this behavior to its extreme. The individual canes of these colonies are short-lived, lasting only a few years, and are typically determinate in growth. They can only grow to a certain height before they stop developing. To keep the plant growing, new canes are constantly produced from the root system to replace those which die. The roots are shallow, without deep anchoring tap roots. Over time, however, Mutant populations of bamboo would gradually arise with less aggressive rates of spreading, but which concentrated more of their energy on producing fewer but larger, taller, and longer-lived individual stems. Their growth rate was slower, but it was indeterminate. Given time, they could grow larger than their competitors, with canes that last much longer. This was the first step to reaching a more tree-like shape and growth pattern, and was particularly beneficial in drier ecosystems, or those where the soil was fairly poor in nutrients. By concentrating on just a few trunks, and increasing its size more gradually, a plant could better grow in less ideal environments, including in the shadow of more vigorous Type A bamboo colonies. Biding their time on what little nutrition they can eventually grow beyond the canopy and slowly shade out their competition. B-type bamboo can still produce canes from the underground root, but far fewer than the ancestral bamboo and much closer to the main trunk, resulting in a small clump of trees together rather than a sprawling colony. In the natural pattern of forest succession, B-type bamboo forests tend to gradually replace A-type forests over the course of about a century, for though type A bamboo is quick to colonize open land, by the time it flowers, the ground will be too shaded by maturing type B bamboo for most of their seedlings to survive. Next is the type C growth pattern, an extension of type B this bamboo produces only one trunk and few or no secondary canes. Its rhizome is reduced, and instead it produces a single, deep taproot to probe the soil for water and deeply buried minerals. Its growth is perhaps the slowest of all, but it is the only type which can reliably take root and survive on dry, exposed hillsides or areas with little soil. Its singular trunk can become several meters wide, though remains hollow and never becomes woody like a proper tree. The only living tissue within it occurs in a ring-shaped cross-section. This makes a type C bamboo tree lighter than a woody plant like a sunflower tree, which makes it potentially more vulnerable to high wind or weather when young but considerably less likely to topple over under their own weight at very large sizes. The first representative of a type C bamboo was the Monovitus tree of the middle Tempicenic. Like this ancestor, many modern examples still flower only once, often at a very advanced age, in such an extravagant show that they use up all their energy and die back to give their offspring a chance to grow in their place. Others, however, have become truly indeterminate growers, growing throughout their life and flowering less abundantly but more frequently, even every year. 
producing fewer seeds at a time, but surely many more over the course of a longer lifespan. In the case of trees that don't die back after flowering, methods to ensure their seeds get far enough away that they don't compete with their parent have had to evolve, and the descendants of the monovitus tree use their symbiotic ants. Now not only do these ants live within their tissues, prune away competitors, and clean them of insect pests, but they disperse their seeds for them across wide reaches of land, each new queen taking a seed with it when it flies away to start its own new colony. It finds a suitable sunny patch of soil and begins to dig a burrow for its new colony, taking the seed underground. When it sprouts, they instinctively guard it and keep its patch of soil weeded, and when it is big enough, it begins to grow swollen bowls at its nodes, which the ants then move into. A single colony will stay with a tree for up to 20 years, the maximum lifespan of certain queen ants, but eventually a queen will die and the colony will collapse. Fortunately for the tree, however, it takes very little time for another young queen to move in and start the cycle again. Indeed, so valuable is a mature tree as a nest site that dozens of queens will fight for the right to use it. Several may even start nesting at different heights within the trunk, but eventually the colonies will meet and have battle. That with the largest army always wins. Because type C bamboo doesn't reproduce asexually at all and only spreads via seeds, it has a higher rate of mutation than other bamboos, giving it improved resistance to pathogens and a better ability to adapt to changing environmental conditions than bamboos that only rarely reproduce sexually. Type C bamboo has taken the ant symbiosis to its greatest pinnacle so far by the start of the cryocene, being entirely dependent on certain ant species to reproduce, but representatives from all growth types provide ants with shelter and sometimes food in exchange for keeping them free of pests and competition. Type A bamboo is the least dependent on them, however, for it grows the most aggressively already that it can compete against most other plants well enough by itself that its symbiotes are simply extra help. The ancestral type A bamboo's rapid growth may in fact have been a contributing factor in later, slower growing species adopting the help of ants in the first place, for they could counteract their less vigorous biology if their helpers pruned away other plants from around them before they were overtaken. Eventually, however, the more vigorous bamboo would begin to attract ants of their own specifically for the purpose of putting the odds back in their favor. Today hundreds of bamboo species exist, with many more symbiotic ant species, all fighting a largely hidden battle for turf against each other, trimming away the branches of their neighbors if any two plants get too close to each other. The Saranen bamboo forests exhibit universal crown shyness to a particularly obvious degree, because anywhere that the branches of two different trees with different ant colonies touch is soon pruned away by the ants living on one or the other. Type D bamboo is the result of an entirely different evolutionary path. A mutation has occurred in these plants that results in two very different methods of growth in a single plant. Canes rise up from the rhizome and expand their mass from the top, adding whorls of leaves and gaining in height by building upwards like almost every other plant. But this type of bamboo also grows from the bottom up. Random sections of the rhizomes gradually lengthening underground until they rise out of the soil, in some places as high as 10 meters, 
raising the bases of the plant's canes up with it, from under the ground to quite a ways above the soil. In this manner, type D bamboo, which is otherwise very similar in its manner of growth to type A bamboo, is able to reach much greater heights as it becomes supported by multiple woody trunks in its old age and towers above its competition that doesn't exhibit the mutation. Of all the bamboos so far to evolve, only this one could be called the tree in the strictest of sense, for with its elevated rhizome, it could be said to have a solid, proper trunk. Canes still die back frequently and re-sprout from the trunk, but with the rhizome now high above the forest floor, they don't need to struggle up through the shaded understory and can grow in the sun from the start. Nonetheless, though type D bamboo is more competitive in dense forest environments than type A bamboo, it's much less suited to colonizing open expanses of land. For when its rhizome rises out of the soil, the canes that grow from it lose their rooting and become wobbly and vulnerable to being broken off. In the forest, they can lean on their neighbors for support, but in exposed areas, they typically blow over in the wind once the rhizome breaks out of the soil and its stabilizing presence on the shoots. The two bamboo types have thus begun to niche partition, type D thriving in forests, and type A in open environments. Because type D cannot survive except in a forest environment of mostly type A bamboo to support it, however, its long-term survival is linked with the other growth type meaning that in order to continue to survive, it must remain competitive, but not to the point of totally outdoing its competitors, for in an ironic twist, it needs them to survive itself. Type D, like Type A, eventually flowers and dies back to the ground as well, and is succeeded just like it by Types B and C in a healthy forest community. The final climax trees to dominate a forest in the end, however, are usually not bamboo at all. They are slow-growing, long-lived sunflowers, which may spend decades biding their time in the shade before emerging to take their place in the canopy. On Earth, the mangrove biome is one of the most unusual of natural environments. Consisting of a varied tapestry of largely unrelated types of plants that have adapted a high tolerance for salt water, it's a habitat of constant change, on the edge of land and sea. The rise and fall of the tides submerge large tracts of it every day, only to leave them high and dry again a few hours later in an endless cycle. The roots of the trees in the mangrove catch soil and sediment washed in by the waves, trapping it, and over time extending the beach outwards into the water so that over many areas the shore extends out further and further, creating new land that other plants can eventually colonize. Mangroves are builders, living a life of extreme literally caught between two worlds. Earth's mangroves are based on a variety of plants, but most notably trees of the genus Oryzophora, the true mangroves. In the thin belt of subtropical climate, Serena retains by the start of the Cryocene, an analogous biome has formed from an entirely different branch of the plant family tree, the bangroove bamboo. Bangroves are a hardy, salt-tolerant bamboo variation found only along the subtropical coastlines of Serena's equator, initially sprouting on the beach, but eventually spreading a considerable distance out into the ocean. They are a distant variety of type D bamboo, 
immediately recognizable by the plant's large, elevated rhizomes, which in mature colonies stretch above and out of the ground as thick, woody trunks, regularly dipping back into the soil and coming out again almost like a sea serpent moving through water. The strange appearance is, of course, a result of the plant's novel tendency to expand from the roots up until in places the plant's root system literally pushes itself out of the ground, sometimes to heights of 20 feet. Unlike most other bamboo, which has developed this mutant growth behavior, however, bang grooves don't produce large canes out of these trunks. Their shoots are stunted and never become hardened, but rather grow from the tops of the highest rhizomes as small clumps of thin, leafy reeds that flex rather than break in the face of wind or water. Bang grooves are thus the only representative of this growth habit that can survive and even thrive on their own, without requiring the support of neighboring plants. Unlike earth mangroves, bang grooves are not singular trees, but rather large colonies that spread underground and through the water. Though a seedling must initially take root on a beach, once it reaches a few years old, it begins to send out runners that take root some distance from it, including out into the water. Colonies can spread as far as three miles from the actual shoreline, formed by floating rhizomes that have spent long anchoring roots through the water, sometimes as far as a hundred feet, and buried themselves in the sand to hold the colonies of floating trunks and shoots in place. Once established far from shore, over the years the connecting tethers of rhizome that originally connected the land-rooted section of the colony with the floating one may degrade, producing large floating forests far from shore that eventually accumulate enough sediment around their free-floating roots to produce a new island. A bangroove's life begins as a large seed suspended from its parent's upper shoots in a clump of three or four similar seeds each encased in long green pods. Whereas both bamboo die back after seeding, the bang groove continues to grow, nourishing the seed with enough food and water that it begins to sprout before even falling off the parent plant. A long taproot extends from the bottom of the seed pod, breaking through it and reaching down to the water. The seed pods will only be released once it is several feet long and sufficiently well grown that the pod will now float upright, weighed down by the root but kept floating by a pocket of air stored in its upper section. Well endowed with food, a seed can survive while floating in the water for as long as six months, during which time it will likely have been carried far away from its parent colony by the tides. Eventually, it is likely to be washed onto the beach, where its root can catch into the sand. Once this happens, it begins to anchor itself at a remarkable rate, its taproot growing as much as five inches a day for several days until it is securely held in place. By now, its food reserves will have run low, having just enough sugar left to allow the seedling to put out its first leaf, a long, unbranched blade about three feet long. From here on it, its growth is slow for the first year or so, as it concentrates more on establishing deep anchor roots to prevent it being washed back out to sea than on upward growth. Once this is done, however, it begins to put out numerous shoots and to spread along the beach. A young bang groove resembles more a bed of rushes than a young forest, but within a few more years, as the rhizomes grow above the ground and lift the shoots off the sand, the forest begins to take shape. 
As it spreads outwards through traditional underground rhizomes, the leading edges of the colony stay small, never extending far enough down the beach that they are totally covered by the sea, for though their roots can handle this, their stems would drown. Only the runners produced from the older, woody rhizomes above the ground can grow out away from the shore, keeping their shoots above the high tide line. These old, woody rhizomes grow higher and higher upwards, their rhizomes contorting and twisting, developing a hard, protective bark, and arc out over and into the water. Eventually, they stop producing underground stems altogether, spreading by sending down long, woody roots to anchor the branches of the rhizomes that stand above the water. On Serena's coasts, the strange growth habit of Type D bamboo has found an environment where its mutation is very advantageous over those bamboo that only spread underground. It's only when the rhizomes have become large, woody, and above the sediment that a colony can survive actually in the ocean, as the roots can only grow in the thick sea mud if oxygenated by the portions that arc above the water, and the shoots could not survive being buried underwater for any length of time. The canes of any traditionally growing bamboo, lacking any rhizomes inclined to grow taller and out of the mud and seawater, would quickly drown in the environment that the bang groove thrives in, and their roots would suffocate in the mud. It is only. It is also only here that the Bangroove's ancestor was able to evolve the smaller and less vigorous canes from which its leaves sprout, for in this extreme habitat there was no traditionally taller and more aggressive bamboo to compete with it for light. Bangroves have a longer lifespan than any other primitive colony producing bamboo for they don't die after flowering. Rather, they bloom modestly every few years, after which individual canes die, but the rhizome survives, sprouting new canes to replace those which degrade. Because they spread indefinitely outwards away from the spot where they initially sprout, and the newer parts of the colony regularly become detached from the old, Bang grooves could be considered biologically immortal. Portions growing on any given coastline could easily be 500,000 years old, or even more, and may have originally germinated hundreds of miles from their current locations. Sometimes a remnant of the same genetically identical colony might remain there, a single organism split into two over the eons. Bangroves are thus sometimes referred to as an altering name, migrating mangroves. Life of the Bangroove Forest Bangroves are a hub for life, both terrestrial and aquatic. Bangroves are considered a foundation organism their presence stabilizing the sediment, building land, and over time providing an environment for the colonization of thousands of other species. The islands that gradually form around their roots eventually rise far enough out of the waves for less salt-tolerant land plants and animals, like the red reed canary thrush pictured at top right which feeds on insects near water, and is abundant both in the bang grooves and in freshwater environments, to survive, while the trunk and branch-like rhizomes themselves form a foundation for epiphytic plants to gain a foothold in the sun while keeping their roots safely out of the dangerous waters below. Countless birds nest in the bang grooves, both those that fly out to sea to feed on fish like the little gull-like violet thernsprite, a piscivorous descendant of early Saranin insectivores 
that now only comes the land to nest, and those which make a living directly within the forest itself, probing for small invertebrates in the mud, like the pair of plover-like ruddy groovecocks above, shown picking earthworms from the mud with their long bills. A descendant of the stiltskins of the Tempesenic, it shares an ancestry with the variety of larger heron and stork-like waders that hunt for fish in the forest's shallow pools for a variety of prey, including whiskered, catfish-like eel snakes, burrowing crayfish, and Sicilian-like species that raise their young in underwater nests dug into the shore. But one of the waders doesn't share a close relation. With a long, sickle-shaped bill curved upwards at its tip, the lower bill longer than the upper, this filter-feeding, flighted basal pelicanary shares a method of filter-feeding with the bloon and the blorca, with a tongue edged in hair-like cilia, but is unrelated. It has a common ancestor harking back to the stiltskins. A very colorful, rail-like bird descended from the gallywalt, meanwhile, has evolved a large bill suited to cracking clam shells, picking the mollusks from the roots of the bang groove during low tide, but not actually swimming itself. From the gallywalt line have also emerged the duck-like sarinan waterfowl, a widely diverse group of semi-aquatic birds with webbed feet that still retain a powerful ability of flight. A pair of some small dimor a pair of some small dimorphic species, the duller hen pictured with three young chicks resting on her back, can be seen swimming away from the Bangroo forest to feed. The Bangroves even have an endemic lineage of symbiote ant, one which takes advantage of its host plant without contributing as much as its ancestors did. The mangrove ants still nest in the hollow bowls that form on the emerged rhizomes of mature mangroves, but as there are few other insects near the area that would try to harm their host, they don't actively protect it, nor do they eat the bitter, salty mangrove plant themselves. Instead, they simply use the plants for shelter, emerging from their nests at the daily low tide mark to scour the newly turned sediment for any little pieces of organic refuse that they gather and take home to the nest to eat. From scraps of algae and plankton to pieces of dead fish or bird. <laughs> when the tide comes back in the ants scurry back to the safety of their nests, which have only one entrance at their lowest point. As the waters rise, they cover the nest completely, but the colonies remain full of air like a diving bell, giving the ants refuge until the waters recede again. Because the bang groove is no longer directly benefiting from the ants' presence, the small hollow bulbs along its roots are no longer ideal, ready-made lodging for ant colonies to move into. In order to make them livable, the ants must chew their tunnels into the spongy tissue, causing the root to grow a larger bowl as it heals from the damage. The mangrove ant's relationship with its host is slowly transitioning to one of parasitism. The ants, one of only a few insects to thrive near the sea, are preyed upon by mud wickets and small tweezer-billed songbirds called ditzes, named for their seemingly drunken tendencies to turn upside down while scurrying along the branches in search of ants to eat, often spontaneously dropping from a perch, some doing a somersault in the air and landing on a lower perch to catch an insect. A mother canaribou intercepts an attack on her youngster 
by a giant falconary. The Canaribou is a large serolope that lives in enormous migratory herds just past the tree line on the northern tundra of Striata. It is one of the larger serolopes of the early Criocene, weighing as much as 1,000 pounds, and is a generalized herbivore that consumes whatever hardy vegetation can survive the harsh polar winters in this region, mainly moss, lichen, and short, hardy grasses and herbs in summer, and pine flower needles and cones in winter, being one of only a few birds able to digest this very coarse and bitter food source, all of which it crops up with a small beak and chews with grinding motions of its hard, tooth-edged tongue before swallowing in a mouth lined with fleshy cheeks. Canaribou live in herds of several million, moving southwards into the pine flower forests when winter is at its worst, and moving closer to the pole during the summer, when the southern areas of the large arctic circle thaw for a few weeks or months. The Canaribou is among the most advanced of the vivas and has begun to evolve a two-chambered digestive system to get the most out of their diet, which is mostly roughage. Food is quickly chewed and swallowed into the crop, which has become a second stomach of sorts, and with powerful grinding motions and the aid of gastrolis, continues to masticate the vegetation into a slurry which is then more easily digested by the true stomach and the long intestines. Canaribous are also ahead of most other ard geese of the area in perfecting the practice of incubating their eggs internally. Because of the extremely cold temperatures in the Saranin tundra by the cryocene, if a canaribou is to breed, it has to begin as early as possible. So cold is the climate the canaribou has adapted to survive in, however, that even if the mother keeps her egg inside her for all but a few hours before it hatches, if there is nowhere clear of snow to lay her egg when it does need to hatch, even a few minutes on the ice can kill the unborn chick. The canaribou overcomes this threat entirely by withholding its egg even as it begins to hatch. The muscles of the oviduct are now particularly powerful and mobile enough to eject the shell fragments without their causing any harm to the mother's internal anatomy, and the chick is kept warm throughout the process while the mother beds down in a thicket out of predator sights. It is, therefore, the first truly live-bearing bird giving birth to a fully hatched infant and never incubating an egg outside its body. By squeezing the egg methyl by squeezing the egg methodically with the muscles of the oviduct, the mother canaribou can also assist in cracking the eggshell to hasten the process, making its young be one of the quickest birds to hatch. The whole process usually completed within an hour or two. The calves are born in the early spring, just before the tundra thaws, and are fed with a fatty milk secretion from their mother's crop stomach until the snow melts enough to let the calves begin to forage for themselves. During the intermediate time, however, the mother is usually not feeding much either, for she must constantly stay near her newborn chick to keep it warm in its tender first days and instead relying on fat reserves to produce the food for her young. Even after they can feed themselves, the young canaribou require significant protection for their first year from predators, being small and defenseless. Mothers are highly aggressive during this time, driving away any creature, no matter how seemingly small or harmless, that comes too close to their offspring. Even larger predatory birds such as pack-hunting banshees or giant falconaries that glide silently over the tundra in the summer 
in search of a lost calf to snatch up. Some of the falconaries found across Serena in the Cryocene exhibit wingspans of more than 20 feet, gliding high on thermals and crossing entire continents, even seas, for a singular hunt. After night falls in the sunflower forests of Serena in the Cryocene, and most birds have retired to roosts high in the branches, one is just waking up to hunt. By day, they hid themselves in shadowy thickets and crevices, with their dark plumage hiding them in shadow and their heads tucked out of sight. When the sun sets, however, the bubbirds, a specialized group of nocturnal falconaries that first arose in the tempestine, raise their heads out from beneath their wings and peer around. Their eyes are massive and golden, with pupils that quickly expand from tiny pinpoints to huge black circles, demonstrating excellent night vision. These birds have also evolved a crude facial disc, a feather arrangement that serves to amplify noises like a radar dish toward their ears, allowing them to hunt without using eyesight at all. For a few minutes after sunset, the hunters preen themselves, readying their wings for flight. And then they lift off, fluttering from branch to branch, peering around for any smaller birds that have failed to hide themselves away well enough for the night. The buburb hunts somewhat like an owl, but is more adept at hopping through the trees and even running on the ground. Its flights are short and relatively weak, only useful for short distances. Stalking along, it quietly takes quick flights from one perch to another and hops along the branches, listening intently and looking around for prey. When it spots a roosting bird, it quickly pounces. But unlike its ancestors, its feet do not play a major role in restraining its victims. Rather, the buburbs have evolved huge gapes and swallow their food whole. The buburb most frequently targets its prey from a slightly lower perch, leaping up, and before the startled bird can take flight, quickly closing the jaws over it, engulfing it headfirst down its gullet. Prey can range from about the size of a sparrow all the way up to birds as large as one-third its weight, which are still swallowed in one piece. All buburbs are nocturnal and well adapted to hide in the shadows. Dark, often black feathers are typical for most species, with some having small white patches that can be kept hidden by day, but are useful for recognizing conspecifics at night. Some species have evolved large, erectile crests along the edges of their facial discs, which are used in sexual display. Such traits are generally important to identify one another as the same species, as different types of buburbs will readily eat one another if there is sufficient size difference, and females of all species are considerably larger than males of even the same species. This allows for niche partitioning so that the sexes do not strongly compete over food. With males catching small animals and females primarily being adapted to consume larger birds. Solitary except for during nesting time. If a female is not in sufficient health to breed or simply dislikes a male attempting courtship, she may even occasionally cannibalize her would-be suitor. The long-eared buburb is a large species of its group, though not the biggest of all. Both sexes are rather identical, with females as well as males having long crests used for courtship display and species recognition, but females are up to twice the weight of males. A female is shown in the size comparison. They feed mostly on roosting ground birds and are competent ground hunters 
that take flight only if threatened, and to reach roosts to nest during the day. Insects, arachnids, crustaceans, mollusks, and cnidarians have all called Serena home since even before the introduction of the canaries. More than 50 million years on, a relatively small group of founders have given rise to many new and novel lineages. The leafcutter ants and their descendants, the phytosocianae ants, plant partners, which live in mutualistic partnerships with most Saranin bamboo groups, are not the only ants of the Cryocene. The Formicidae are still among the most successful insect groups on the planet and occur on every landmass. The original process of evolution which gave rise to the mostly flightless, subterranean ant as we know it in the Cretaceous era has worked backwards on some of these ants, giving rise first to the primitive gnat-like honey ants, which were mainly nectivorous, which have now split into three distinct groups. The true honey ants, which are still nectar drinking and often social, very much like honey bees. The more generalized hymn flies, which are usually solitary and take diets ranging from nectar to smaller insects to carrion and even blood, and later to several other wasp-like lineages which keep their wings throughout life, exhibiting a wider variety of lifestyles including sharp-jawed, agile predators that feed on other insects. Known as vespers, they are a polyphyletic assemblage of at least three independently derived groups. Some descended from honey ants, and others independently derived from basal ant ancestors, but all of which, for the most part, are similar enough in relation to one another than their exact ancestry is not of importance to the layman. Some vespers produce venomous stings like wasps, defensive and offensive abilities which have already evolved and been lost several times, while one solitary group known as the fang flies have evolved large, mobile jaws and a venomous bite to subdue its prey. Vespers may be either social or solitary, hunting alone or building nests in trees or underground. The largest solitary species, adept pursuit predators in the air with two pairs of independently mobile, dragonfly-like wings, each five inches in length, and may occasionally take small birds as prey, while smaller but highly aggressive swarming species are capable of killing much larger animals to defend their colonies. In the inverse, small blind ants, which spend almost their entire lives deep below ground, have evolved, converging on termites. Some forms even built towering mud structures for their colonies on Serena's plains, and at the shores of the equatorial oceans, specialized mangrove ants survive in a world that is submerged in seawater almost 50% of the time. The burrowing crickets of the Hypostocene and early Tempocenic have continued to diversify and spread across Serena becoming both herbivores, like voles, and carnivores, like moles. Herbivorous species tunnel just beneath the surface of the soil, chewing at plant roots and tubers, others burrow down deeper in search of worms and other meaty prey that they dismember with large, sharp mandibles. Though most species are small, in the range of 1 to 2 inches, relative giants still exist. Burrowing crickets often live longer lives than their ancestors and survive multiple seasons. Surviving winters by burrowing deep underground 
below the frost line and hibernating. Some species from temperate seasonal environments, having very slowed metabolic rates and needs for food, may live to and attain a weight of four pounds. Herbivores feeding on the sap of tree roots, they avoid most predators by merit of almost never coming above ground. Their anatomy has changed markedly to facilitate this lifestyle, their hind legs becoming small and their front legs adapting into enormous claws to move soil. They are blind and basically deaf, relying entirely on their sense of smell and touch with long sensitive hairs on their bodies and lengthy antennae. They have also lost their wings entirely. Other crickets have evolved down an opposite path, becoming better flyers. Large herbivores, some exhibiting biomimicry to resemble leaves or twigs, others known as floor gusts with giant, brightly patterned wings, flutter through forests and chomp on leaves. Species have diverged which take alternative food sources including fruit and nectar. On the plains, powerful jumpers reminiscent of grasshoppers have evolved. They typically have well-developed wings, as well as some are migratory, following rains to evergreener pastures. Though their numbers are normally small, like locusts, they may periodically explode into plagues when conditions are right, with potentially catastrophic consequences to grazing animals, but producing a flush of food to insectivorous birds. Crickets have also adapted to more generalized cockroach-like niches, omnivores that scurry through the leaf litter of forests and eat decomposing organic matter. From this group has also arisen a lineage of raptorial predators that catch other insects in sharply clawed forelegs. Some crickets combine behaviors of several of the above groups, spending many years underground as blind, wingless nymphs feeding on roots. They may molt periodically into winged and sighted adults all at once and take flight as a swarm to feed and breed for only a few weeks, every 10 or 20 years. Ladybird beetles have also diversified, including the cuckoo ladybirds, whose larvae have become almost indistinguishable from those of the ants they predate. But the ants are not always such unwitting surrogates anymore. Whenever a beetle becomes too aggressive in parasitizing an ant, the ants realize something is wrong and tend to become wise to the trick of the imposters, killing them but unintentionally selecting for baby beetles that are even more similar to their own young. Eventually, the larval beetle is so indistinguishable from its own infants that the workers can't find it. The parasites proliferate eating up their host's rightful young, until the colony may eventually collapse. Fortunately for the cuckoo ladybird, there is still an almost limitless number of other naive species to pass its young off on, with only a slight change of perfume needed to mimic the new adopter's scent and trick them into adopting the killer baby. The larvae now don't look exactly like those of this new species, for they were adapted to mimic another which has either died out or become too uncommon for the beetle to bother with. The cycle thus repeats, with the beetle larvae coming to look more and more like its hosts, until either the ants end up caring for nothing but a nursery of killers, which eventually molt in beetles and leave the colony vacant of labor and doomed to die. 
or oppositely, the ant becomes completely wise to the beetle's game, and able to detect the slightest difference in the parasitic larvae, becoming intolerant of any of them. Unfortunately, the latter scenario can also go either way. In a desperate attempt to save their colony, worker ants can become confused, killing and mutilating every single larva indiscriminately, including their own, and doing themselves in in an ironic twist of fate. Burying beetles have produced a wider variety of descendants that fill different niches. Some eat the dung of birds, others have become more mobile flyers that lay their eggs in carrion without burying it, like flies. Fast running sorts have become active predators on the forest floor. There are few herbivorous beetles on Serena, with crickets and ants filling most of these niches. Though the larvae of some burying beetles have adapted to feed on plant matter underground. The small biting mites introduced to Serena very quickly swelled to larger sizes, becoming tick-like. Active predators appear from the detritor- The small biting mites introduced to Serena very quickly swelled to larger sizes, some becoming tick-like. Active predators appeared from the detritivores, giving honor to their relatives on Earth, the spiders, as true active hunters. Proper web building has not yet evolved, but varieties exist which shoot their victims with silken threads to snare them and then reel them in to kill with a venomous bite. Copepods are now major players in Serena's sea, as they are on Earth, forming a significant percentage of zooplankton. A myriad of almost microscopic species occur in such numbers as to be all but impossible to estimate near the water's surface, feeding on microscopic algae and forming the basis to the marine food chain. They have also produced larger forms however, several inches in length, which stroll like krill in enormous numbers, feeding on the zooplankton and themselves being fed upon by fish, seabirds, and of course, the majestic bird whales. Shrimps descended so long ago from the diminutive freshwater Neocaridina are also diverse, ranging from free-swimming, krill-like varieties to large predatory prawns, one group of which is experimenting with gliding out of water to escape its own predators, using wing-like paddles derived from one pair of its legs. They're omnipresent at sea and in inland waters, along with the generally more armored and less mobile crayfishes, which are beginning to give rise to short-tailed, crab-like representatives as well as giant oceanic lobsters and primitive burrowers. Hermit crabs are universally abundant in the shallow seas and warm beaches near the equator. Only aquatic forms were introduced, but some quickly redeveloped a fondness for land. Some have gone so far as to leave the beach and move into the subtropical forests, going to water only to breed and then in freshwater pools rather than the sea. They begin to forego a larval stage, hatching into miniature versions of the adults, which are aquatic for the first few months until they too leave the water. To survive the cold in more seasonal climates, some burrow. Triops are effectively unchanged, common across Serena's driest environments, doing the same thing they've done so well for now over 350 million years. Snails are still numerous, but on land they will never again reach the sizes they did in Serena's first few thousand years. Predators now abound. In the water, 
They are preyed upon by large prawns with powerful claws which find the weak points in their shells, smashing them open. On land, specialized ants do the task, chewing away the hinges of the door-like structure the snail closes to seal itself inside, and carrying the shells underground to use to shelter their eggs and larvae. But the snails are not totally without defense. Some small arboreal species, when pressed by their ant predators, can vault themselves off a branch with an explosive plop of their door, falling to safety somewhere lower in the canopy. When the danger is gone, they emerge and crawl back up a different tree. Grazing sea slugs still grow to larger sizes than they ever have on Earth in Serena's warm waters, some as big as manatees, where they feed on algae and other water plants. Some of the most unusual survive in a world of keen-eyed hunters, despite being almost blind, by being extraordinarily poisonous. Their danger makes them beautiful, however, brightly colored and tasseled with strange display structures, floating silently through the shallows like aliens from another world. Some forms, known as molentees, have developed sharp, stinging tendrils that coat their backs, an armor impermeable to any predator, but to which a handful of specialized fish have forged an alliance with. Protected by thick mucus on their bodies, squat little platy descendants, called daredevils, make the backs of the slugs their home, much like a more mobile version of the clownfish anemone symbiosis on Earth. As the slug swims around and searches for food, it disturbs a constant stream of small zooplankton as it pulls up the plants from the sand, a feast the daredevils quickly zip out to catch before darting back to the safety of their deadly abode. A deadly poisonous molentee swims idly through the shallow tropical seas. A family group of daredevil fishes nesting in its stinging back tendrils for shelter. Art by trollmans.deviantart.com Bivalves have become Serena's first reef builders. The calcified shells and the resinous glue they use to attach themselves to the sediment with forming lasting underwater mountains of limestone. Forming only where currents bring nutrients to near shore environments, they are less common than coral based reefs, which can survive anywhere the sun shines brightly enough. But where they do occur, they produce an exceptionally rich community of plants and animals. Living clams attach in great numbers at the top of the reef and from there they filter feed, adhering to the shells of many generations of their deceased elders, while plants and algae also gain a foothold, even on the shells of the living bivalves themselves, while generations of hollowed out shells provide a deep, labyrinth-like shelter in the heart of the reef for a variety of aquatic animals to make their homes. Oceanic Hydra have developed forms likely similar to the ancestors of coral and anemones. Much larger than their early ancestor, they attach to the tops of the reef with their own calcified crampons and compete with the clams or zooplankton as it floats by, with some of the larger species feeding on fish. Many varieties blossom like flowers at the top of the reef, their tissue colored brightly with photosynthetic algae as they slowly reduce their ability to actively feed and rely predominantly on energy taken from their new symbiotic partners. In the coming eons, these cnidarians are likely to replace the bivalves as Serena's main reef builders and converge a further upon their distant earth relatives, the corals. Hydra have also evolved more mobile descendants. Radially symmetrical, flattened hydras 
develop a convergent appearance and behavior to the starfish. Crawling over the seafloor, their mouths turned down to the sand as they hunt actively for small animal prey. The difference being once they find it, they ensnare it in a mesh of venomous tentacles. Jellyfish, the Hydra's distant relatives, have so far undergone very few major innovations, their ancestral habits being as suitable today as tens of millions of years ago. A variety of Hydrambularans, a clade of large starfish-like hydras, native to Saranen seas 50 million years post-establishment. The Driftwood Stinger is among the most primitive walking hydras. It can only move freely only early in its life. The stinger feeds on small fish and plankton caught in its stinging tentacles and is sessile as an adult. Young stingers attach their foot firmly to a piece of floating wood and cement themselves permanently with a glue-like secretion, spending the rest of their lives in place and budding off smaller clones until a small colony is established. If food is abundant, the clones remain around the parent and a large group develops but if food is scarce, they will detach and float away to find a new log to colonize. The Dead Man's Hand is a primitive walking hydra that retains a body and a foot it uses to inch itself along the sea floor in search of small worms and fish buried in the sand, which it stings with its tentacles. Its venom is weak, only strong enough to stun small prey and of little harm to larger predators, so this species spend as much of its time hunting as it does hiding in the sand. The Bloody Mary is the most derived species pictured, having reduced its body to a flat, round form that most closely resembles a starfish. This species is also a bottom-dwelling predator of sand-dwelling prey, but it is marked boldly with spots and stripes of red and white, advertising rather than hiding itself. This is because the Bloody Mary is particularly venomous and will quickly turn around and sting any creature that attempts to bite it severely enough to cause death through cardiac arrest. Floor gusts are a group of large winged, usually colorful flying crickets widespread across Serena. They exhibit the most advanced adaptations to flight of all crickets by the cryocene, with a single pair of broad wings that are frequently marked with bright and beautiful patterns, formed by millions of small, iridescent scales, which may serve to help individuals to spot others of their species to find mates, to camouflage, or to warn potential predators that some species may be poisonous if ingested. The wings used by the Florgus to fly are actually the cricket's second pair, the first reduced to vestigial rubbery wing coverts, just a few millimeters long. Florgusts are agile flyers, able to maneuver well and stick their landings better than most other flying crickets. They occur across a wide variety of habitats, from rainforest to open grassland, sometimes alone, and sometimes in large groups. Most floor gusts have short lifespans, surviving over the winter as eggs which are buried in soil, develop in the spring, and mate in the fall. Though some species live several years, mate multiple times, and migrate to avoid cold weather in regions away from the equator. Like all crickets, Floor gusts hatch as nymphs, miniature but wingless versions of the adults, which typically sport cryptic colorations of green, gray, or brown, and only attain their vibrant adult pelage with their final molt, when their wings also unfold and let them take to the air. Nymphs, obviously incapable of flight, initially feed on the leaves, 
shoots, and buds of a variety of vegetation, grazing with well-developed chewing mandibles. As they molt and become progressively larger, however, their preferences change, and as adults their mouthparts have become reduced and a long brush-like tongue has developed in their place, used to collect nectar and pollen from flower blossoms. Adult florgusts are mainly nectarivorous. Nectivorous. Nectivorous. Adult florgusts are mainly nectivorous, fluttering between blossoms and performing a vital service of pollination. Though some species continue to consume vegetation, even in their final adult stage. Young florgusts are well-suited jumpers with long hind legs that let them easily careen between distant branches and trees, or alternately, to cover large distances on the ground. As they grow, however, the hind legs don't continue to grow at the same rate as other limbs, so that by the time adulthood is reached, they are only marginally longer and not particularly suited to jumping anymore, for the volant adults no longer need this ability to get around. Florgusts are sexually dimorphic. In some species, the only major difference between the sexes may be size. Females are always larger, sometimes dramatically. Most florgusts, however, exhibit a degree of niche distribution and behavioral differences. Males, being smaller and lighter, have larger proportional wings, shorter legs, and are more specialized to feed on nectar, while females are larger, heavier, and retain more adaptations to feed on foliage, with bigger mouth parts, longer legs, and proportionally smaller wings. The heavier females are less mobile, spending more time feeding on plants and trees than flying and thus use less energy moving about and are able to put more of what they have towards producing eggs. The daintier, agile males are therefore adapted to search out the females with longer antennae and a better sense of smell to find their pheromones. Typically both male and female are brightly colored as adults, but often with patterns distinct enough that combined with the disparity of size and form, males and females of one species can sometimes be mistaken for two different sorts of insects. Mature female, male, and juvenile nymph of the Angiskin orange band florgust, a species that feeds on short prairie grasses and dandelion shrubs on the savannas of northern Angiska, a much drier habitat in the Cryocene than it was many millions of years ago. The female of this species is not only larger, with stronger jaws, but also differently marked, with bold blue patches on her wings that her mate usually lacks. She also sports a long ovipositor on her tail, through which her eggs are laid into the soil. This species has a lifespan of only about five months, surviving the region's cold winters as dormant eggs in the ground. Molebirds are a locally abundant but isolated group of burrowing finches directly descended from the ground sarens, which can only be found in the southern half of North Ankiska in the Cryocene. In the 50 million years since we last left off, evolutionary process has substantially reshaped and refined the basal canaries from an unspecialized relic reliant on the burrows of another animal to survive into a capable digger in their own right. The ancient symbiosis of its ancestors with early burrowing crickets gradually dissolved as Ankiska's climate became colder and its deserts gradually became replaced by grasslands and recently broadleaf forests, with the crickets becoming increasingly adapted to a life wholly underground and independent of the surface. 
and thus no longer reliant on the bird's keen eyesight to avoid aerial predators. Nonetheless, the canaries stayed with their symbionts, making use of their tunnels long after the crickets required them, and over time they too developed their own adaptation to burrow. Their wings reduced to muscular arms suited to pulling themselves through tunnels and pushing aside soil, but unlike the bumblets, a burrowing viva group which utilizes their wings to burrow, it was their beak that became their shovel. It began to grow continuously, replacing keratin that was worn away and chipping at the soil, and both jaws became sharply pointed and lined to grind together like the teeth of a rodent. A pair of mole birds. The majority of species are difficult, if not impossible, to identify physically, distinguished only by differences in vocalization. Their feet became oversized and positioned far back on the body, useful to kick away loosened soil, while their eyes dwindled until they were so small as to leave their owner virtually blind. They followed their partners into the dark depths, never to return, in pursuit of nutritious roots, tubers, and insect larvae that they searched out with a newly redeveloped sense of smell. The soil provided shelter and stability in a cooling climate, and a safe and warm place to nest in almost any season, provided they went down deep enough. While their flying kin were forced to migrate southwards every winter, the ground sarens sought refuge much closer to home and avoided the harshest cold by simply burrowing to a depth where it didn't reach. Avoiding the most polar environments, where permafrost makes burrowing difficult, they thrive in the broad band of land between the southern coast and the tundra, busily tunneling out their largely secretive existence beneath meadows and forests, and almost never coming intentionally to the surface. They have become extraordinary efficient respirators, able to survive anoxic conditions in deep underground tunnels that would otherwise suffocate a human, as well as to allow them to roost and breed down and out of reach of most of their powerful predators, such as the large, predatory mole crickets that can only get enough oxygen to support them just below the surface. Unfortunately, the mole bird cannot entirely cut off the surface world, for at least in the summer, when it must forage daily for food, it must spend a substantial amount of its time in shallow tunnels very close to the surface and in reach of the roots or invertebrates it feeds on. It is here that the crickets may lie in wait and ambush them. In winter, they are usually safe for the crickets, unable to survive at the same anoxic depths as the mole bird due to their less efficient respiration, must hibernate to survive the cold. Once friends, now foes, these two old partners have definitely grown apart over the eons. A blind, carnivorous burrowing cricket snares in its claws a mole bird as it forages near the surface. Additionally, for a few nights in the spring, the mole bird is forced to leave its refuge entirely in order to find a mate. On cloudy nights, as the ground begins to thaw, they emerge in small groups all across the land and crawl above the ground on their bellies. Males emerge first and sing a raspy chirping song not unlike a cricket's, soon drawing attention from the females, which then emerge in response. Mating is quick, and a single copulation is usually all that it takes to fertilize a female and once a pair has coupled, they part ways and return underground, as every moment spent above ground is a moment they are in danger of being killed by surface predators. Indeed, males have an unfortunately self-detrimental tendency to not return to their burrows 
unless they successfully breed a female, instead spending many hours outside the burrow calling even after no females emerge. As predators quickly converge on their conspicuous calls, and a mole bird is virtually defenseless on land, many, if not most males, that do not breed in the first few moments after nightfall are killed and eaten before morning as they call for female company. Ensuring that not only do the least fit in the population not breed, but are actively culled, allowing the future young of the more successful breeders a higher availability of food and territory. Omnivorous and carnivorous diets have now evolved independently in several viva lineages. In addition to the primitive ancestor of banshees, which first adopted predatory leanings, a group of serolopes, in order to survive in the harsh polar wastes, have since also developed generalist tendencies. Directly descended from the canaribou, which itself is still extant, the boar bird hunts the northern taiga and tundra region of striata, eating almost anything it comes across. Whereas the boar bird's ancestor ate mainly lichens and pine needles, the boar bird now favors meaty food, chasing down smaller birds, searching out carrion with a keen sense of smell, and also digging up tubers and gorging on seasonal gluts of seeds and fruit in the short arctic summer, only relegating itself to grazing when other food is in short supply. The canaribou's small bill tusks have become tooth-like projections in the boar bird, useful to cut and dismember meat from carcasses and dispatch small animals. Its stomach remains chambered but shows signs of a reduction in complexity, shorter than those of other serolope, and the chambers smaller and less well-defined, while the grinding plates on the front of its tongue have become sharper and pointed, in convergence with the banshee, as a bone-stripping tool. As spring thaws the tundra, an opportunistic boar bird feeds on carrion, perhaps a canaribou calf that has not survived the winter. The boar bird is smaller than its ancestor, lighter and leaner, and is solitary. Its wings are almost vestigial and of no practical use, with the spurs but a tiny claw and the primary feathers just a few wispy tufts. Rather interestingly, northern populations of boar bird still associate closely with canaribou herds, picking off weak and ailing young and feeding on voided eggshell fragments after chicks are born, which are frequently still well vascularized with blood vessels and edible tissue. The most likely origin for the boar bird is that a group of canaribou, facing a particular harsh string of winters, may have been forced to feed on their weaker fellows that succumb to the cold in order to survive when plant food was unobtainable. Eventually, as the population became distinct, predation upon one another's living young may have been the next step, resulting in the solitary behavior of the modern boar bird, which retains cannibalistic tendencies towards offspring rather than its own. To get by in one of the harshest of all biomes requires complete adaptability, sometimes to a very extreme extent, if a creature is to survive. We are now 15 million years into the Cryocene, 65 million years post-establishment. The global climate on Serena has changed very little since the start of the Cryocene but life continues to evolve. Ardgeese continue to diversify and are now almost uncontestedly the dominant megafauna group on land over Serena's eastern landmass, as well as being ecologically diverse, if less monopolizing, in the west. 
high levels of competition between the different flightless canaries, both vivas and other groups, continues to produce waves of new radiations as new groups diverge with increasingly complex specializations that give them just a little bit more of an edge against their competitors. The earliest art geese were flightless, cursorial grazing canaries, which evolved within just a few million years on Serena's lush, grassy plains. They swallowed leaves, seeds, and strips of grass whole, tearing and pulling with a serrated bill, and practiced hindgut fermentation to digest it all. This primitive method of plant digestion is less efficient than rumination, but worked well for breaking down the coarsest plant foods, such as dry grass, and allow the animal to survive on a diet of lower quality than other herbivores could, by letting them constantly take in small quantities of food throughout the day. The earliest ard geese were thus mainly grazing animals, and had to spend almost all of their waking hours feeding to survive. The ard geese, in turn, gave rise to the vivas, which appeared now 40 million years ago in Serena's East. Defined by the co-evolution of internal egg incubation and a primitive chewing ability, resultant from scraping a rigid tongue against the roof of the mouth, which improved their ability to digest tough plant foods. They too were herbivores, entirely flightless and well adapted to run. They developed more efficient digestive systems and chambered stomachs and the ability to ruminate, regurgitating food back into the mouth and chewing it multiple times. Just as mammals as diverse as deer, giraffes, and even kangaroos, which also evolved the behavior independently, do on Earth, which no longer required they feed quite as often. The first vivas evolved as browsers, but some of their descendants reverted to grazing behaviors. Unlike ancestral ard geese, however, they were now more selective. Rather than feed on large quantities of whatever they could find, like a horse, they picked and chose only the most tender bits and the newest growth. Many earth ruminants have similar tastes such as gazelles and wildebeest, which despite being advanced ruminants, do still feed on grass, but in different ways than the zebras they coexist with. By 50 million years post-establishment, the vivas in turn had radiated significantly away from this ancestral niche and produced not only a myriad of new grazers and primitive browsers, but also omnivores and even a group of obligate carnivores, the raptorial banshees, which in multiple environments across Serena's east outcompeted other predators, despite being heavily adapted as herbivores due to the much more efficient method of rearing their eggs, which the group has evolved compared to other birds, a great advantage in cold climates. In the common ancestor of the omnivorous group, which diversified into animals as distinct as the banshees and the shimmer snoot, the chambered, complex stomach rapidly and dramatically reduced in size and length, for a diet of animal protein is easily broken down and indeed can sour if it stays in a lengthy digestive system for too long. Carnivorous vivas did not lose their modified chewing tongues, though. Rather, in the banshees, the organ became armored in barbed spines, a tool perfect to strip flesh from bones, while in the shimmer snoot, it became a bony implement to pulverize mouthfuls of ants and break up their exoskeletons before swallowing them. Now 65 million years have passed since the canary <clears throat> sorry Now 65 million years have passed since the canaries were introduced and the vivas have given rise to another highly successful lineage the Ceralopes Ceralopes evolved initially 
as one of those selective grazers just touched upon above, but notably have evolved the most efficient chewing apparatus as yet evolved in any bird. The tongue is large, strong, and highly muscular with a bony core and is covered upon its upper surface in a series of keratinous plates which mimic molars and grind in a circular motion against a series of similar plates that cover the roof of the mouth. As an advantage over mammals' teeth, the Ceralope's tongue and jaw plates don't wear out, as they constantly grow outwards as they are worn down through the process of chewing. To prevent food from falling from the mouth, and allow the Ceralope to chew, swallow, and then regurgitate mouthfuls of food to chew again as it ruminates, they have evolved fleshy cheeks that run along most of their jaw. The jaws are almost completely soft and fleshy, with gums which were once a hard beak, save for multiple rows of tooth-like keratin plates in the upper jaw. Indeed, while the beak of most vivas still covers most of both jaws, on Ceralopes, it now only covers the very distal edge of the jaws and functions only to crop plant material, like a set of incisor teeth. Ceralopes evolved in the northern plains of Serena's eastern continent, but rapidly spread southwards and now cover the entirety of that continent. On the top, a banshee, a specialist predatory viva, showcasing its barbed, flesh-stripping tongue. On the bottom, a serolope, a specialist herbivore viva, showcasing the skull and bony grinding tongue jaw and extent of soft tissue. Serolopes were the first canaries to produce true live birth, but the retaining of the eggs inside the mother's body until after hatching a seemingly simple step that marks the final culmination of the process of internal incubation will over time occur again in other viva lineages. A drama unfolds on the lush, temperate highlands of a mountain range in Equatorial Hualteria, 65 million years post-establishment. Too strange Colorful creatures engage in a race for survival as a predatory viva pursues a vegetarian relative. Both males, and more colorful than the females of their respective species, both animals are adapted to endurance running with lean figures and very long legs, making this a race whose outcome is very much up to chance. The prey animal is a member of a primitive lineage of serolopes known as flutterbox, highly dimorphic herbivores with colorful, long-plumed males and dull-colored females whose wings and tails are short and stumpy, in sharp contrast to the long, colored feathers that adorn their mates' bodies. The dimorphism is due to the fact that the males are highly polygamous, competing with their colorful plumage and elaborate dances to breed as many hens as possible. The flutterbok is mainly a low-level browser, feeding on tall grasses, sunflower trees, and dandelion shrubs, with well-developed chewing abilities and a tiny reduced bill with spacious cheeks to accommodate this. The predator is also a serolope, albeit one which has evolved into a dramatically different niche. The third lineage of carnivores to evolve in the vivas, trunk snouts, despite their funny appearance, are a group of cunning and almost completely predatory animals. Unlike the primitive banshees with their long, open jaws, this very derived group diverged after the evolution of cheeks in their herbivorous ancestors. And in addition, males sport a large, inflatable trunk on their snouts 
which is used in their own courtship displays and to amplify their calls. The tongue jaw is well developed and contains the most specialized keratin teeth of any viva. Most notable are two pairs of pseudo-carnassials on each side of the tongue and the upper jaw which work together in a shearing motion particularly effective at chewing meat. This particular species, the saber-toothed trunk snout, does not actually utilize its sabers to hunt at all. Rather, they are weapons for intraspecific fights against other males and, like the trunk and bony ossicones of the head, are absent in the female sex. Trunk snouts are often social, hunting cooperatively with a mate or a small pack, in which case they may operate as a relay to run prey animals into exhaustion. Prey is disabled with a crushing bite to the windpipe, which is particularly damaging due to a combination of a sharply hooked bill and the jagged teeth that line the jaws, but a group will start eating as soon as it stops struggling, whether or not the victim is actually dead. Though they can and do hunt other large flightless birds, a substantial part of their diet still comes from small animals and carrion. Trunk snouts are opportunistic, and though their digestive system is very short and no longer suited to eat grass, they will also eat certain seeds and fruit whether they come across it. Carnivory in the trunk snout first evolved at the end of the Tempocenic era, 40 to 45 million years post-establishment, by which time the first recognizable cheeked serolopes had just diverged. Judging from their jaw morphology, their earliest ancestors likely fed on aquatic vegetation, gradually including aquatic animals in their diets before moving to carrion and living terrestrial prey in a very rapid progression of under 10 million years. Upon evolving the shearing teeth, which make them especially effective predators, which have their basis in sharply cusped structures likely used to crush the shells of crayfish and freshwater invertebrates, their group has since been evolving and diversifying at an exceptionally rapid rate and spreading both northwards and southwards and shows a high degree of evolutionary potential. Though vivas, which evolved after the separation of Anchisca and Striata, are still restricted to Serena's eastern continents, the broader Ardgoose family from which they descend has a cosmopolitan range. Though representatives here are not as diverse ecologically as their kin in the east, they still comprise a very wide variety of herbivores, among them the largest terrestrial bird anywhere on Serena by this time. In the sprawling tropical and temperate forests and woodland savannas of equatorial South Antkiska can be found a group of enormous browsing ard geese known as Sarah Striders, some of which can reach heights of 40 feet and weights of several tons. Adapted to browse the highest branches of trees inaccessible to most other animals, many species have evolved necks that make up more than half their heights in addition to long and robust hind legs. The body is carried mainly horizontally and the stomach is proportionally quite large in order to effectively ferment a diet of leaves and branches without ruminating, as the more derived serolopes are able to do. They lack the adaptations of their eastern relatives to chew their food before swallowing, and instead crop leaves and shoots whole with their goose-like serrated beak, then swallow the pieces whole and break them down in a large gizzard, 
aided by many pounds of rocks, swallowed to aid in crushing the food to a gritty pulp before it is swallowed. Anywhere that forests grow here, cerastriders in some form are likely to occur in abundance, either living a solitary life in the depths of the shady forest glade, or moving in migratory herds of a hundred or more on the plains. Forced to move constantly from one patch of woods to another, lest they deplete their food supply. A solitary bull, elegant Sarastrider, browses peacefully upon the canopies of a bamboo woodland in the quiet of dawn, whilst largely still hidden in shadow, with the sun just beginning to creep upward from the horizon. Able to reach leaves more than 30 feet above the ground, it has few competitors for food here, and at such a size, few predators are likely worry it, allowing an adult Sarastrider to feed at a leisurely pace. In the event a large carnivore does threaten the gentle giant, it hides a secret weapon under its muscular arms. Normally folded out of sight, the bones of the hand have fused into a giant scythe claw which lies hidden against its torso, which the strider does not hesitate to flash if pressed by unwelcome attention. Sarah striders perhaps most notably differ from vivas in their reproduction. While vivas are extreme K strategists, producing only a single chick at a time, and nurturing it through a lengthy childhood, Sarastriders are oppositely extreme R strategists. Instead of one egg in a season, a female produces as many as 10 to 15 of them over as many days. Being too large to incubate them, she instead lays them in large mounds of sandy soil and decomposing leaf litter in forest clearings or the edges of jungles where a combination of the sun and the heat gained from the decay of the plant matter will keep them warm, returning every day to deposit another egg into the pile with a long, extendable cloaca that can reach down to ground level and bury the egg into the soil. Every morning the mother-to-be will return to the nest, pile another few inches of soil over the surface, and deposit an egg before moving off to feed, sometimes making a round trip of 10 miles or more every day to do so. Though she may guard the mound half-heartedly for as long as she is actively laying, once her last egg is dropped, she pays no further attention to the nest. Even though she lays her first and last egg as long as two weeks apart, the chicks will typically all hatch within a day of one another due to the fact that the eggs laid even only a few days earlier and near the base of the mound in the spring will develop at a slightly slower rate than those laid later and toward the top of the nest mound where the sun's heat is most direct. As females typically nest in close quarters to each other in favorable nest sites where the soil is soft and most suited to mound building, the result is that as many as several hundred chicks will emerge at once. The young are super precocial and fully able to run and feed themselves at birth, and though many surely are killed whilst emerging and in the days following, the sheer numbers of chicks are usually enough to satiate any local predators and ensure at least a small percentage survive the initial onslaught and escape into the forest. Sarastriders are often spotted significantly far south of the tropics and populations of some species may migrate even down through southern Stedlandia and into the Antarctic Circle during the summer, feeding in taiga forests, but all species must make the lengthy trek northwards again towards the equator to breed, for only here is the summer long enough to incubate their eggs. 
Some species may make this trek only a few times per decade, while others breed annually and do not stray as far away from their nesting grounds through the rest of the year. Though in their first few years mortality is high, once they near their adult size, Sarastriders have few natural predators and very long lifespans, which give them time to skip a nesting season occasionally and still produce enough surviving offspring to replace themselves in the future breeding population. Sarastriders reach sexual maturity much earlier than might be expected, between 10 and 20 years of age, often when they are nowhere near fully grown. Though the males are rarely able to mate until much older due to competition with far larger senior males. Though they do eventually stop growing, this may not be until the age of 50, albeit beyond 25 years or so, the rate of increase each year slows dramatically. Adults may still make the trek to breed at advanced ages of 150 years, though fertility, particularly in females, is likely diminished far before this time. Males, however, remain fertile and may continue to sire offspring throughout their lifetimes, and thus the most common pairings are typically of very old males, which typically win mating rights due to their size, and much younger females. Sarah striders are not even a little monogamous. Solitary species live lonesome lives while in herding species, usually only immature young and adult females live together, with the adult males being pushed out of the group at maturity to live lives as loners or in loose bachelor groups. Most species are thus sexually dimorphic, with larger and more colorful males that compete for female companionship during the mating season. A particularly strong old male may oust every competitor in its range and mate with more than 100 females in a season, making many species highly reliant on migration to other areas to prevent inbreeding once these siblings and half-siblings mature. A pair of crested, double-barred cleaner finches clean a juvenile serastrider. Though large enough that few other birds can prey upon them, there are hungry predators that gain their sustenance from the great serastriders, parasites. Biting vespers take a toll in the hot summers, while blood-sucking mites can feed throughout the year, kept warm under their plumage. Covered from head to toe in fuzzy, hair-like feathers, and with necks so long as to be impossible for an individual to groom on its own. The gentle giants are a walking buffet to dozens of invertebrate pests, seemingly offered up for the taking. But this is not entirely true, thanks to another of Serena's endemic symbiosis. A variety of Serena's giant birds but especially the Sarastriders, rely on mutualistic relationships with far smaller insect-eating finches to keep their plumage clean of dead tissue and insect parasites. Birds such as the Sarastriders are large enough that they themselves support their own small, portable ecosystem, of which their own blood forms the basis and sparrow-sized insectivores fill the niche of apex predators. The Sarastrider is so large that it seems to not even notice the flocks of small birds climbing all over their bodies and picking through their feathers. Even when the finches alight on their snouts and pick at their eyelashes and into their nostrils, if an unfamiliar bird tries the same thing, however, the giant reveals that it clearly does pay attention, 
for it will quickly shake the intruder away, avoiding other finches that might potentially do it harm. Indeed, another group of canaries, aptly known as bloodpeckers, also frequently try to glean a meal from the large ard geese in a much more harmful way. Thus, via convergent evolution, most cleaner finches that service the Sarastriders have evolved similar markings and color schemes to show that they mean no harm. These patterns are often remarkably similar, even across totally unrelated clades. A bright yellow head and a blue body, with obvious black stripes running along the eye and down the neck. No one can say for sure why this pattern seems to have become the universal signal for a pest removal service, but whichever bird first adopted it has been mimicked at least six times in unrelated groups of birds across the Western Hemisphere, all cashing in on the same bounty of food. The system is usually mutually beneficial. The Sarastrider is kept clean of pests and the finches fill their bellies. But not all finches are friends to the giant. Some species mimic the coloration of beneficial species but are actually parasites themselves, enlarging wounds to lick the blood and even taking small pieces of living tissue rather than eating insects. Some of these pest birds evolved directly from formerly beneficial cleaner finches which went to the dark side. Others seem to have evolved independently from other lineages, including the bloodpeckers themselves, one species of which seems to be evolving to take on the same pattern, but to be not completely there yet. Without quite the correct shades and proportions of color, sometimes it is tolerated and sometimes shaken off aggressively by the Sarastriders. With those birds that look most like the harmless cleaners being able to get a blood meal more frequently, the Sarastrider is inadvertently cultivating a pest that will, over time, become harder and harder to distinguish and weed out from its kinder fellows, in a rare natural example of Vavilovian mimicry, or its animal equivalent. The true cleaner finches also perform another service to the Sarastrider in eating aggressive bamboo ants that might be disturbed while the giant feeds on the host trees. While some species specialize in plucking ticks from the Sarastrider's feathers or catching flies as they try to land and get a drink of blood, perhaps the most specialized of all are ant eaters that spend almost all of their time crawling along their host's snout, where the armored beak meets the plumage. Here they snatch up any and all ants that rush to the defense of their host tree, killing them before they get a chance to bite or sting the sensitive skin on the Sarastrider's face. The Sarastrider is thus able to browse freely, and the anteater canaries allowed access to a limitless supply of food for almost no effort, as their host literally brings the food to them as they perch upon its nose. Bloodpeckers are a family of carnivorous finches native to the Western Hemisphere, most of which are parasites to larger animals. The group has its evolutionary origins far back in Serena's history, diverging from all of the world's birds more than 60 million years ago, and have been targeting the blood, skin, and other small bits of flesh from large flightless birds for as long as they've existed. Though some bloodpeckers feed opportunistically on insects, they have never specialized as insectivores at any point in their evolutionary history, and likely made the jump to parasitism from feeding on other birds' eggs and nestlings. Most of a bloodpecker's anatomy is fairly generalized 
and similar to other songbirds, though their toes have become zygodactyl, with two facing backward, in order to better facilitate the clinging and climbing on the bodies of larger animals, often clinging upside down on bellies and other areas their victims cannot easily knock them from. They are small and stocky, their wings are relatively short and their tails stumpy, and their heads often rather large for their size. Generally, because of these traits, they are weak flyers. The beak is tipped with a sharply angled hook, which is used to make small cuts into other birds' hide. Though they do take a fair amount of liquid blood, the bloodpecker's favorite food is the skin and underlying fat and muscle, which they cut from the wounds they dig out in tiny strips. This very nourishing food source makes up the majority of what they feed their nestlings. Because a bloodpecker can cause significant harm when it feeds, it does a potential victim well to be wary and drive off the parasite before it lands. The fear of the vampires likely a driving factor in the specific color patterns adopted by the harmless cleaner birds to make them immediately distinguishable. To make themselves less noticeable, most bloodpeckers are therefore nocturnal and cryptically colored. Guided by large eyes, they make their attacks under the cover of darkness when their prey are asleep, or at the very least, less able to spot them before they feed. Only the false cleaner finch, which mimics the colorful markings of a harmless cleaner bird, feeds exclusively by day. The actual feeding process is usually brief, with the bird landing and immediately getting to work nipping a small wound, then quickly slicing off a strip of skin and flying off. But through the course of a night, a bird will frequently return for seconds and thirds, joined as the hours pass by other individuals taking advantage of the injury, so that by morning, a prey animal may find itself with one or more quarter-sized wounds up to half an inch deep. A healthy Sarastrider or other large bird quickly heals and will not suffer any long-term effects from the bloodpecker's feed. Though old individuals are frequently pockmarked with healed scars from bloodpecker wounds under their plumage, but the birds can cause significant weakness to already ailing animals too weak to fend them off, in which case the birds may even be bold enough to attack in daylight. Bloodpeckers are naturally drawn to open wounds and the sight of blood and will congregate on injuries sustained by other animals, even carnivores, to pick at the exposed tissue and lap up any flowing blood. Though the bloodpecker does cause injury to healthy animals, its actions of picking at already open wounds actually serve a beneficial purpose by removing dead, septic, or diseased tissue, as well as insect larvae, and cleansing the wound of infection. Relatives of the bloodpeckers are another group of carnivorous finches known as strack birds, or colloquially just strax, short for distrax, a name that only makes sense once one is familiar with their behavior. Unlike true bloodpeckers, the strax don't feed on living animals, but still have a taste for blood. Rather, they associate closely with large predators, often riding directly on their backs, and assist the carnivores in killing prey by flying ahead of their host and harassing potential prey animals. Better flyers than their kin, they dive bomb other animals and peck at their eyes and ears in an attempt to distract them from keeping an eye on their surroundings while their host approaches and makes an ambush. Taking advantage of the chaos, the predator hopefully makes a kill before the prey can react and try to flee, 
in which case the small finches will swoop in and steal their share of the riches from the carcass, being small enough that the carnivore scarcely pays them any mind. In between kills, the Strax feed on their host's parasites in the dried blood that sticks in their plumage after a feed, serving a hygienic function sufficiently beneficial to the hunter that, for the most part, it completely ignores their presence. Unlike the other bloodpeckers, they are usually diurnal and often brightly colored in shades of yellow, red, and orange. From left to right, orange shouldered strackbird, common bloodpecker, false cleaner finch. The orange shouldered strackbird is a relatively large, thrush like bird common across the grasslands of South and Kiska, where it associates closely with large carnivorous skikes, distracting herbivores to make them more vulnerable prey to its host and scavenging any successful kills the carnivore makes. Common bloodpeckers, about as large as a zebra finch, are small nocturnal parasites which target large forest-dwelling birds, feeding in small flocks under the cover of darkness. Its wings are edged in hair-like filaments that serve to dampen the sound of its wing beats, allowing it to flutter almost silently as it comes in for a meal. The false cleaner finch is a house sparrow-sized diurnal bloodpecker evolved to mimic beneficial cleaner birds. It hides in flocks of similarly marked cleaners and follows them from one serastrider to another, while its company busily pick away the giant's parasites, the false cleaner opens up wounds and picks at the host's blood and tissue for its own sustenance. Both Strax and Bloodpeckers are not always successful in their attacks, however, for some species of beneficial cleaner birds, in an effort to protect their food supply and therefore their hosts, will drive off other birds, both competitors and predators, that approach too closely to their chosen individual or herd. Similar to the battles that rage between Serena's bamboo trees and their symbiotic ant colonies, a similar evolutionary arms race has begun between different flightless birds and their own flying symbiotic partners. On the connected continents of South Ankiska and Stevlandia, predatory skikes, flightless, fast-running predator canaries, are still abundant and diverse. They range widely in size, from shy, hen-sized forest dwellers upwards to some of the world's largest land carnivores, though the majority fall somewhere in the middle. They may feed on insects and arthropods, smaller finches, fish, and even other large flightless birds, but always use their large beaks to deliver the killing blow. The shape of the bill can vary significantly. Lanky sword bills grab smaller animals in a straight, stork-like bill and swallow them whole, while tyrant sarans have a powerful crushing bite able to shatter bone. Small forest dwellers have a tweezer-like beak to pluck insects from tree trunks while wading species spearfish with long, thin beaks suited well for stabbing. Some early skikes, which did not need to run at too fast a pace to catch the fairly slow and plodding giant canaries of the hypostasine, lost their wings entirely. But this body plan wasn't as suited to chasing the faster prey that would gradually evolve soon after. All species to survive to the Cryocene descend from a more basal ancestor, which kept their wings and could balance better during high-speed chases, and thus the majority of extant species now retain fairly developed forearms 
and wing plumage. Unlike the banshees, modern skikes are usually endurance hunters. Rather than leap onto their prey in ambush, they run it down in the open. Though smaller skikes survive in the east, the largest and most impressive hunters are endemic to South and Kiska. The grandest of all are still members of the Tyrant Saren group, specialist predators of other large megafauna. They kill their prey by biting onto the neck and severing the spinal cord, the jugular, or the windpipe with a notched, serrated tooth on either side of their upper and lower jaws. Some cryogenic Tyrant Sarens have become veritably gigantic, reaching weights of 3,000 pounds. Lacking a proper tail, like has reappeared in some of the vivas, they nonetheless do have elongated tail vertebrae that serve to lengthen the body somewhat and improve their balance. The rest, however, is dependent on their posture. As in most birds other than the vivas, the thighs are fixed toward to set their center of gravity further back, and their wings are used to steer. Giant tyrants are able to run at speeds over 25 miles per hour, sufficient to catch the other giant birds they prey on, such as young Sarastriders. But it is the smaller species that really excel in this department. Certain smaller tyrant sarens have specialized almost as avian cheetahs, compromising between two methods of running not normally seen in a single animal on Earth. Some are able to reach extraordinary speeds of nearly 70 miles per hour in short bursts, but also to run for more extended lengths of time at slower speeds, closer to 30 to 40 miles per hour, depending on the circumstance in behavior of the prey species in question. Others are complete endurance hunters, chasing herds of ard geese in packs and picking off the weak that lag behind. The red-fronted tyrant Saren, shown with a pair of commensal strackbirds in tow, is the heaviest skike ever to live, and the largest land predator anywhere on Serena. 65 million years post-establishment. Standing a little more than 7 feet at the hip, adult females can reach a length of 19 feet and weigh one and a half tons. Hunting a wide variety of habitats upon South and Giska, from the temperate forests to the deserts and the crashing Hunting a wide variety of habitats upon South Angiska, from the temperate forests to the deserts and the crashing seashore far inland to the dry savanna, they feed predominantly on Sarastriders, picking off the old, young, and ill, but will consume almost anything they can catch, including carrion and ocean refuse. Male and female are broadly alike, save for size. Males are only two-thirds the size of their partners. They also have more white around their eyes, with a brow arching over the eye, and in some subspecies, attaching to the cheek patch. Females exhibit only a white marking on the cheek, and a similar patch under the eye. Both genders exhibit a cap of red plumage on their foreheads. Males attract mates and intimidate rivals with infrasonic courtship songs. Though inaudible to human ears, these follow a similar range of sound to that of the modern canary, simply at a far lower pitch. Sword sharks, a clade of unusually intelligent and frequently social descendants of swordtail fishes, remain a highly successful predator guild in the Middle Cryocene, 65 million years post-establishment. 
These fishes are uniquely coordinated hunters and communicate with one another via visual cues and body language and boldly flashing markings. Groups divide up smaller bait fish into tightly crowded balls, then split and divide them amongst themselves. Sword sharks are also placental, nourishing embryos in utero via a tie to their own bloodstream, and so producing only a very few young at a time, but giving birth to offspring which are very large and well-developed, and individually have a very high chance of survival. In the middle of the Cryocene, one of the most quintessential examples to be found of these social predators is the godmother night shark, a remarkable animal with a rather strange name that nonetheless sums up its behavior quite well. The godmother night shark is a nocturnal predator relying on acute vision to catch smaller fish under cover of darkness, which shows highly pronounced behavioral sexual dimorphism. The male is a lightly built, open water pursuit predator, while the female is larger, moves more slowly, and forages along coastal habitats near the sea floor, catching prey as they sleep. The female of the species shows some of the most well-developed pro-social behavior of any fish ever to live, and forms lifelong relationships with related females. Clans of two to as many as twenty such females are formed based on kinship, most often siblings, mothers, aunts, or cousins. These groups live together and cooperatively hunt for prey. Movements of the tail sword are utilized to communicate intention and emotion, angling in different ways as a sort of meter of the owner's emotional state as well as to indicate what they will do next in the hunt. Males lack any sort of sword at all, as it would interfere with their higher speed lifestyle, and thus their cooperative hunting behavior is more opportunistic, self-centered, and less cohesive. Females coordinate to drive smaller fishes from hiding places and into another's waiting jaws. Their sharing is not only a matter of one sometimes getting the fish, then another taking a turn, but rather frequently involves highly ritualized parting out behavior where the individual which successfully obtains a prey item at the expense of another will be solicited by the other less successful clan members to share. Those who have had less hunting success will sidle alongside her and vibrate their jaws against her throat, which in turn results in her regurgitating a portion of the prey for the other members to eat. This ensures every member of the hunting party is always fed, and in turn is strong enough to hunt again the next night. This food sharing is done reciprocally, strengthening social bonds and trust between individuals in the clan. Cooperation hunting is common to sword sharks. Food sharing is much less so, but even more rare is the degree of parental care provided by the godmother, which not only cares for its own offspring, but those of other females in their clans. Two offspring are usually birthed at a time, and all of the individuals in a group take turns guarding the birthing mother and then the newborns from predators during this highly vulnerable time. The newborns stick close to any nearby adult and for a few hours imprint upon the scent of its clan. Though well developed and able to hunt small prey for themselves almost from birth, the young are primarily fed by all of the adults via regurgitation of finely chewed particles for the first eight weeks of their lives. Females may spend a lifetime with their clan, though groups will break apart when they grow too numerous for local food resources. Males go off on their own around a year of age 
and join into bachelor groups of largely unrelated males, but may occasionally return to their natal groups for several months later, only being aggressively excluded once they are sexually mature. This occurs for a very good reason. Adult male godmother night sharks are both cannibalistic of the young and extremely aggressive in pursuit of mates. A godmother night shark gives birth, guarded from attack during her most vulnerable moment by a roving male, by another female clanmate. Indeed, it is this latter attribute which is the primary cause for the evolution of their species into such disparate male and female morphs. To better dominate mates is also why the male has remained social, despite being a relatively poor cooperator with limited capacity for body language communication due to the lack of a tail sword. They need groups to overpower the larger females to mate with them. This is a species engaged in an evolutionary arms race between the sexes, where males have become increasingly aggressive in seeking to breed, while females have evolved their own countermeasures to avoid undesired breeding, and so choose their own partners. To avoid such aggressive males, which seek to violently force copulation, females adapted to band together and so collectively drive off male pursuers that might injure them in their drive to reproduce. This arms race has begun selecting for two very distinctly behaving morphs of males which seek to overcome this barrier to reproduction either through increasing aggression further or conversely by being gentle and romantic. Females prefer romantic males which are a distinct uncommon morph, with much less testosterone, which shows more normally female-specific behaviors, including pro-social food sharing. Romantic morph males must put in a lot of effort to successfully breed, and are less likely to succeed than their belligerent relatives, which means they are always less numerous. They play a long game to win the favors of the females and will frequently leave their bachelor groups and trail behind female clans for days at a time, bringing small gifts of food before being accepted to mate. Aggressive males, in contrast, don't wait to be invited. Entire packs descend upon female clans and seek to isolate one at a time to forcefully copulate. If they are able, they will kill all of the young first which reduces the defensive response of the females and makes them less reluctant. It is thus in the benefit of the female to live in clans as large as possible to defend themselves from these bands of aggressive males and have the opportunity instead to cavort with gentler options. Yet ultimately this is dependent on available food resources. Where not enough prey exists for large clans to form, females must contend more often with aggressive partners. For the survival of the species, this is not all bad. Such aggressive males are likely to produce initially stronger young at birth, which have better responses to avoid predators. Yet this selective pressure, if unchecked over generations, can produce males so aggressive they are likely to kill females entirely before breeding. The population could not survive with only aggressive males becoming increasingly violent over the generations. The relatively rare but highly sought after romantic males maintain a balance in the population as a whole, and persist despite being less individually successful because their genes limit the aggressive tendencies of the population as a whole. On South Antkiska, a relatively new group of large canaries known as Sarastriders 
which we saw last 10 million years ago, are still achieving a great deal of success as the primary megafaunal browsers of the continent. They have begun to diversify in form and behavior, with some becoming the tallest birds ever to live, while still others find success in an opposite way, evolving a much shorter stature due to the fusion of their growth plates very early in life versus their relatives, which means they reach their adult size even before sexual maturity, opposite to most Sarastriders which grow late into life. These Sarastriders are true dwarves relative to their ancestors of 10 million years ago, and may only weigh a little over 100 pounds, with a height at the head of about 5 to 6 feet. This renders them quite unable to reach the canopies of the forest trees, but they don't need to. Known as Narabex, they are alpine specialists, using their shorter and stockier builds to keep their center of balance low, and living on the scree slopes of sparsely vegetated mountainsides, where few other herbivores live. Their necks are relatively short, their faces very flat, and the beaks blunt to crop short weeds right down to the rock that they sprout from. Because they have few enemies and need to calculate long distances between perches, their eyes have moved to the front of their heads, providing both binocular vision and a very strange appearance. The growth plates of their leg bones fuse very early in life, greatly reducing their height, but giving them increased strength to withstand the rigors of leaping across the rocks. The Narabex has four toes on each foot, and has repurposed the nearly vestigial hallux of the ancestral Sarastrider back into use as an additional gripping digit to hold on to the unstable ground, while the outer toe has also begun to splay and be able to turn outward to further provide stability. Like mountain goats, they move quickly and easily over steep terrain, with large, rough scales on their footpads providing traction. Mountain slopes are a cold environment so the Narabex is well insulated against winter's chill with a thick, feathered coat. Food is also relatively scarce here, and what can be found is often fibrous and not very nutritious. So to cope, the Narabex have retained a proportionately huge, fermenting stomach even as their body size has reduced, as well as evolved a lower rate of metabolism. Their feathers are very dark, allowing them to absorb heat from the sun in the mornings instead of having to burn additional calories to become active, and after foraging they can lower their energy expenditure even further and enter a semi-torpid state to rest and digest their food, during which they lie cryptically along the mountain in the shade of boulders, hiding from the few and mostly airborne predators likely to bother them at such a high altitude. Though Narabex live in groups for safety, there is little cohesion, virtually no long-term bonds between individuals, and neither a leader nor any care afforded to the younger individuals. Females descend to lower and warmer elevations in the spring to bury their eggs on a sunlit slope with loose soil and then return to their preferred higher slopes, leaving their young to develop via the heat of the ground. When the chicks hatch, they are fully independent and able to find their own food, but vulnerable to predators until they can climb to relative safety high up on the mountain where only a few larger flying birds pose any threat. If threatened before they can find refuge on higher ground, 
young Narabex are capable of climbing trees as well, utilizing the large wing spike on their wrists, like the gaffs on a lineman's boots, to dig into the bark and to climb for safety.